Quick turnaround. I'm getting a bone density and body scan to measure my bone strength and muscle mass. Blood draws to screen for things like genetic cancer markers, cholesterol, and vitamin deficiencies. Oh, last one already? You're on the last one. Yay. A test of my resting metabolic rate to see how many calories I burn just by existing. So when I'm resting, my body's burning a, a, a thousand calories. Around a thousand, around a thousand, thousand calories. calories. And a standard physical. Ever been told you snore? No, I don't think I snore. Dr. David Fine founded the Princeton Longevity Center in 2001 to help people optimize their health with nutrition, exercise, and medical care with the hope of living longer and better. Who makes an ideal patient? Because for some people, knowing what's coming down the road can make them more anxious and more stressed. On the one hand, that's true. On the other hand, though, you have two choices. You can find out what's going on or it can find you. Where is the sweet spot where some things may resolve on their own versus I'm going in and doing so much intervention and some of it may not be necessary. Well, you know, certainly a lot of things do resolve on their own. What we're really looking for really are more of the things that are going to be the chronic diseases of getting older. Your risk of diabetes, your risk of heart attacks and strokes, your, your cancer risk, for example. My day continues with a CT scan of my heart and body. A few tests down, a few more to go. Nearly three and a half hours later. Breakfast at last. A quick bite and a cardiac stress test with a sports physiologist. This is definitely aptly named stress test. Then a vision and hearing test. Next up is the ultimate athlete stress test. I thought that walking thing was hard. I think this is going to be really rough. The price you have to pay if you want to be an athlete. <laughs> what if you're just a reporter? I'm hooked up to the same machine used by Olympic athletes to measure my oxygen output and heart health. You got it. You got it. The view from the top unbeatable but after 10 minutes with the speed and incline creeping up i'm beat ah i survived it barely i get my results quickly your act, heart is acting like a 28 year old but when i meet with the nutritionist who reviewed my food logs she tells me to beef up my protein intake out of all your calories only 15 percent is coming from protein how much so should be coming should be 30 to 40. oh wow yes then i get the verdict on my overall health on the whole you're actually in really good health dr fine says the scans did find the bone density in my hips is below normal and my body fat percentage was above average at 36 percent he recommended weight-bearing exercise and strength training. It's time to pump exactly. me up. Hmm. Then an unexpected result. You have a small nodule okay. over here in your left lung. It's this little guy right there. Wow, okay. Dr. Fine says it's likely a harmless lymph node, but recommended I get scanned in a year to check for growth. We don't yet have a lot of data on the experiences of people who are taking up these new services. Dan Belsky is a professor at Columbia University's Butler Aging Center. If someone doesn't have the time or, frankly, the money to invest in a screening like the one I underwent, what do you tell them to do? Eat a healthy diet, exercise, fill your life with things that matter to you. A social network surrounding and supporting you, that can be incredibly important for building healthy longevity. If you want to try it, Belsky says, talk to your primary care doctor about the tests you want to take, research the facility and provider credentials, and avoid untested procedures that promise anti-aging effects. So the, the big question, can you tell me how long I'm going to live? You are certainly younger biologically than you are chronologically. We will get to the Smucker's Jar. And as a result of my visit, I've actually changed a lot of my habits. I've purchased a weighted vest. It's six pounds. I wear it when I walk to help increase the bone density in my hips. I've also upped my protein take by adding things like fish, turkey jerky, and protein shakes to my weekly meals. But again, these clinics, they're not cheap. My visit costs about $5,000. Some of these longevity clinics offer services throughout the entire year, though. That can go for $60,000 or more. A lot of it is not covered by insurance, so always ask ahead of time. Now we turn to another hot topic, anti-gray hair products. According to Advanced Dermatology, 30% of Americans say they spend the most money on their hair color. It can be tempting to try a product that promises to reduce or delay gray hair, but do they really work? Call it 50 shades of anti-gray. One of the hottest hair care trends for those looking to hold back the hands of time. 
I recently found this gray hair treatment. We're hoping for the best. It's supposed to go deep into the scalp to the bulb and restore the hair color. All you have to do is target your gray areas. Some sharing their experience on social media, trying popular serums and supplements, promising to delay the gray. This is what it looks like. I'm also not ready. You just apply it kind of in lines for any salt with my pepper. Feels nice. If anything, I'm at least getting a scalp massage. With 6 to 23% of the world's population showing at least 50% gray hair coverage by age 50, in the past year, search interest in anti-gray hair serum climbing 280% in the U.S. alone. We just have to kind of accept some facts of life and gray hair is one of them. Dr. Mona Gohara is a board certified dermatologist. What causes gray hair? We're all born with a certain number of hair follicles and a predetermined number of hair follicle cycles. There are little pigment producing factories in our hair follicles called melanocytes that give us our hair color, sometimes the melanocytes get tired, they just don't want to work anymore. And that's when our hair turns gray. She says anti-gray products aim to stimulate those melanocytes. Do they work? Can I make a joke and say it's kind of in the gray zone? <laughs> Whether the melanocytes are actually nudged is questionable. I don't know that we have any definitive science to say that that's actually happening. One well-known plant-based serum containing ingredients like caffeine, peptides, and vitamins promises to deliver real, visible results in as soon as 90 days. According to its website, the company behind the serum bases the statement on a three-month clinical study of 15 participants, of which 64% reported seeing less gray hair. For best results, the brand also recommends using its Gray Delay Supplement, a blend of vitamins, antioxidants, minerals, and botanicals, described as ideal for those with little to no gray hair. While the Food and Drug Administration does not review anti-gray hair products for safety before they hit the market, Ohara considers them low risk for side effects, which could include irritation from serums or gastrointestinal issues with supplements. They're pretty safe, and that's why I think it's okay to try it on a small area. But she says check with your doctor before trying them. While prices vary per product, serum and supplement combos can cost $70 to $140, with most brands offering a discounted price when you sign up for a monthly subscription. Gohara says before spending your money, look to the root of the problem. It is 100% about our genetics. Now, there are other things that can give us gray hair, Vicky. There are some- Like my kids. That, yeah, oh, definitely. Your teenagers. <laughs> In a statement to NBC News, Vegamore says their serum helps reduce the appearance of grays on new hair growth, and their supplement helps preserve the hair's natural pigment and delays grays. All right, coming up, think twice before posting photos online. The unintended consequences of a photo post. with a warning about photo fakes as more of us rely on online connections professionally and personally how do you know who you're really talking to is that profile picture the real person 
It's a problem that's becoming more common. Here are the red flags you need to watch for. How many of you have been threatened by someone who's upset thinking they know you? All of you. They're young, they're good looking, and they're on social media. Kayla, Cammie, Tristan, and Justin say scammers have stolen their images to create fake online profiles and then use those profiles to lure people into online relationships, grooming them into sending money. I had a family contact me and they wanted me to inform their grandfather like that it wasn't me that he was talking to. Is this something you have to deal with every day? Yeah, 100%. All say their photos now live on hundreds, even thousands of fake social media profiles, many times using their real names. I've actually been contacted by like the FBI, NCIS, basically confirming that I'm not behind all of this. These women, they spend thousands of dollars thinking I'm going to come see them. Justin says he saw a post online, a woman celebrating her engagement to him. He messaged her and warned her husband to be wasn't real. Then the scammer saw Justin's comment. The scammer calls me and he's like, you're messing with my business. And I'm like, it's my face. This is not your business. Justin recorded the call. Oh, everybody but this poor girl, right? What did you say? Well, no. Tristan, a fitness coach, says some women who thought they were having an online relationship with him even hired him for in-person training. They just want to confirm that it's actually me, and then they'll just waste my time. Cybercrime continues to rise in America. Last year, reports of romance scams alone amounted to a reported loss of $1.3 billion. Among the top lies used to ask for money, someone close is sick, hurt, or in jail, and I am in the military. Three of these four have served or are serving. I think that military personnel are targeted because you can use the excuse because of security concerns. I can't send you a picture right now. I'm not allowed to video chat. California-based Social Catfish is a people search engine that focuses on online safety. Their search results help customers find and remove fake profiles. The internet's still the wild, wild west. There are very few laws to protect you online for the use of your images. CEO David McClellan says these stolen images can lead to very real danger. I had people actually showing up and, you know, getting getting upset with me in person. And it's even happened to me. Vicky, we decided to run your image and here's what we found. We found a Vicky Wynn channel selling for $799. We also found a clubhouse link of somebody actually using your image to most likely talk to other people online. And we found a celebrity foot website that has all your feet pics. My feet? That is gross and weird. McClellan says you can take steps to protect your images. Set your social media profiles to private. Limit what you post, add watermarks to your photos, and run reverse image searches. It's free with Google Images. If you can't meet the person within like a week, it's not real. By the way, those websites that were found with my pictures, Social Catfish has helped me take those down. And a few good reminders, never send money to someone you haven't met. Anytime someone online asks you for money, stop contact with them immediately and report that to the FTC. Artificial intelligence technology is also making it easier for scammers. A simple phone call is all it takes to extort money. The FBI says on average, victims of schemes using new voice technology lose about $11,000 each. And recently, scams have reached a new level with AI clones that look and sound like real celebrities spreading fake messages online. Today we are launching an investment project that... From Elon Musk pitching an investment opportunity to Gail King promoting a weight loss product. Follow the link right now and learn more about my secret. It seems fake ads made with AI are everywhere. Even Tom Hanks has found himself an unwilling spokesperson, warning his Instagram followers, there's a video out there promoting some dental plan with an AI version of me. I have nothing to do with it. While celebrity endorsement scams are nothing new, in the age of AI, these deceitful deep fakes are becoming more convincing, fooling those who buy into them. The FBI says last year victims lost a record $10.2 billion to scams and other online crimes. With just a few seconds of audio, new artificial intelligence software can clone a person's voice. 
As an actor, I pretend for a living. As an actor, I pretend for a living. And a scammer can make it say anything. The Federal Trade Commission issuing a recent warning that voice cloning technology is making family emergency scams more convincing. Earlier this year, several Oregon school districts warned parents about a spate of fake kidnapping calls. A recent global survey showed one in four people saying they've experienced an AI voice cloning scam or knew someone who had. I got a phone call from an unknown number, and so I pick up the phone and I say hello, and my daughter Brianna says, Mom, and she's crying and sobbing. Jennifer DeStefano says she was convinced her 15-year-old daughter, Brianna, had been kidnapped. And uh, she says, Mom, these bad men have me. Help me, help me, help me. She fades off as man takes over the phone and says, listen here, I've got your daughter. She says the scammer threatened to harm her daughter unless she sent him a million dollars. How much did it sound like your daughter? It sounded, I never doubted it was her. I, I had a full conversation with her. It was the way she cries, it was the way she sobs, it was the way she would respond to me. Jennifer was able to connect with her husband, who confirmed Brianna was safe. After warning her friends and neighbors, Jennifer says she's heard of similar incidents. Whether it was a kidnapping, whether it was an accident, you know, they were in jail, all these different types of scenarios. We're going to have a completely new group of scammers and threat actors. Wasim Khalid is CEO and co-founder of Blackbird AI. I saw that in some of these voice cloning programs are as cheap as $5 a month, and you can take someone's voice off of a social media video, use AI, and make that voice say whatever you want it to do. Is that really happening? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's basically the, the revolution in AI over the last six months. The key takeaway here is generative AI is going to be the catalyst to drive misinformation, disinformation, and warped realities further and faster than we've ever seen before. He says if you get a suspicious call about a family emergency, first authenticate the person by having them confirm information only you two would know. Have a private safe word for your family and have someone else call your loved one's actual phone number. Because with AI, what you see and hear is not always what you get. Up next, a new Uber feature that allows teens to order their own rides Consumer Confidential continues right after the break. Popular rideshare Uber has a new feature that could make things a lot easier for busy parents. Have you ever had a child stuck at school while you're at work and unable to pick them up? Introducing Uber for Teens. Good morning, boys and girls, and welcome to what we're sure will be our greatest year at Rydell. 
As classic as the movie Grease, so is the ritual of returning to class. And with it comes hectic teen schedules. School, sports practice, band, even going to the mall. Solving the riddle of all those rides can be worse than a wordle. I should know, my own teenage daughter Emerson is as busy as ever. So we're trying out Uber for Teens. It's a new service that allows teens to order their own rides. It starts here on my phone in the Uber app. Teens can actually create an account on their own. A parent or guardian has to invite them. So you go to your Uber app, hit account, and then family and teens right there, invite family, and there it is, add a teen. The app, designed for teens 13 to 17, sends Emerson an invite. And from there, she creates her own teen account after reading a safety tutorial. Uber says parents should talk to their teens before they use the service. Remind them to check the license plate. Ask the driver who they're picking up before getting in. And never sit in the front seat. I'm ordering my ride now. Oh, here I am at work and I just got a text. Yep, it's a notification. It says Emerson just requested a ride and the driver is arriving in four minutes. The car pulls up. Hey, how are you? Who are you here for? Um, Emerson. Yep, yeah, all right. But the driver can't start the ride without a personal identification number or PIN from Emerson's app to ensure she's in the right car. We will have uh, one uh, PIN for me. The PIN is 6255. She's on her way, while I follow along from my office. It shows me Emerson's been picked up, and it shows me she'll be dropped off in seven minutes. I can even call the driver to check in. Is Emerson in the car with you? Yes, ma'am. She is here. Great. Is everything going okay? Everything perfect, ma'am. Just perfect. Hey, Emerson, are you there? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Everything's good on your end? Going great. Uber says drivers with teen passengers can't change drop-off locations, and if the drive goes off course or stops for extended periods of time, Uber will call the driver and teen, and if necessary, 911. Uber Vice President Sachin Kansal notes the safety features are mandatory and cannot be turned off. Our kids are very precious cargo. For parents, the most important thing was visibility and tracking. Can any driver drive teens or do they have to go through a vetting process? They have to be an experienced driver on our platform and they have to be positively rated throughout. In addition, Uber says it conducts criminal background checks and reviews driving records every year, providing a new option for busy parents just in time for the start of school. Thanks for the ride. We also tried the new Uber Eats feature for teens multiple times, but we did experience a few glitches from not getting notifications to receiving the wrong order. Uber tells us that this feature is still being tested and developed. Coming up, the latest housing trend, what to know about build to rent communities that are popping up across the country.
Imagine living in a three or four bedroom home, two car garage and a backyard without all the responsibilities of home ownership. Introducing build to rent communities, entire neighborhoods of single family homes built just for renting. They're popping up across the country and they're already helping to alleviate the national housing shortage. The American dream isn't for sale, it's for rent in this community near Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to Harmony Heights, 153 and four bedroom single family homes, all brand new and part of the build to rent trend. Renters enjoy modern appliances and luxury finishes, spacious closets and smart home technology. An app allows them to request fixes. Their monthly rent and a small fee cover all maintenance and landscaping. Think of an apartment complex, except you break it down into single family homes. Richard Ross is CEO of Quinn Residences. Who is renting these homes? A third of our residents are people who can't come up with a down payment. They can't afford seven, seven and a half percent mortgage today. But two thirds of our residents are residents by choice, meaning they elect to rent. While the median sales price for existing homes has dropped nearly 2% from last year, a recent report shows renting as more cost effective than home ownership in 95% of the U.S. right now. Here in the United States, there are almost a thousand of these build to rent communities with single family detached homes. More than 500 are in the works. Each community has 50 or more homes renting for an average of $2,000 a month. I never even heard of a community that was strictly a rental community. So I was pretty intrigued by it. Luke and Rebecca Montgomery spent a year looking to buy a home, but struggled to find anything within their price range and big enough for their family. Then they found this neighborhood on Zillow. This is not the time to buy or, or build. We would rather wait it out a little bit and see what happens. So this was just the right solution for us. How nice is it to have the benefits of home ownership without the responsibility. It's nice to be able to know that in the event something happens, it's not all going to fall on your shoulders. I can find myself very bored. I don't have to cut the grass. Empty nesters Marco and Myra Martinez says the low maintenance lifestyle gives them more time to enjoy the things they love. I love to hear the birds uh, singing and to see the trees uh, behind my house. It's beautiful. A career change prompting their move from Texas. The couple says instead of buying, they decided to rent so they could see if they liked the area first. This community offered us a, a great opportunity to rent a house where we feel safe. You don't have to own all the time. I mean, you can make the decision of renting and, and, and thinking about it. And sometimes that's better than just uh, owning. You can use an online calculator like one of these to see if it makes sense for you to rent or buy in a particular location. People are taking a different path to home ownership. David Howard, CEO of the National Rental Home Council, says Build to Rent provides an innovative way to introduce supply into the housing market, which is an estimated 6 million homes short. What does it mean when it comes to affordability? It is almost $1,000 less expensive on average to rent a single family home than to make a mortgage payment on a single family home. When considering Build to Rent, experts say do your homework. Look for reputable developers. You can search those affiliated with the National Rental Home Council at buildforrenthomes.com. Also, think about location and if the community matches your family's lifestyle. Tips to help you lay the foundation for your version of the American dream. That is our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, 
These beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Dookie Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eater is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Dookie Chase's. And I'm Edgar Dookie Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dookie Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po' boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African-American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, 
passing away on June 1, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades, from red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la dukey. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. If you think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. Gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African American restaurateur is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We are enjoying everything. everything. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet. 
It was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner, Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks who are in the North, they still experience poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Kalepsi, Ozzie Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so, he, yeah. after a meal here, after yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you and the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. No, is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, See yeah. How gentle he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. Now this now is you're worth, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're person. For. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect? Wow, the seasoning is moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I can come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at b and Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists UEP Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, babe. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Well, good morning. Welcome to The Boost. We're going to start your day off with a boost of positivity and some good vibes. So we're going to start with a New York City nonprofit helping young chefs fulfill their dreams. Chanel Jones shares how the Food Education Fund might just be the secret ingredient behind some of New York's finest restaurants. Keep your ears open for the next call. It has the stress and energy of many restaurant kitchens. One hour before for everything to be outside. One hour. Yet this one is a classroom. Oxtail will go right here. These young aspiring chefs are high school sophomores and juniors at Food and Finance High School in Manhattan. I need someone to do a chiffonade on the basil. Perfecting the art of setting tables. You need to know as a server, oh, my table's about to get up and go to the buffet. I gotta make sure that their situation is, is reset. And preparing all the dishes for their monthly luncheon, a showcase for these teenagers pursuing their dreams. Beautiful. It's about being able to be yourself and put your own twist and spins on certain dishes and also being able to create what you think people will love. Food is somewhere that I can get away from everything. I'm working with people with all different types of experience levels and it's fun. You get different perspectives and stuff like that so it's, it's more fun than anything else. <laughs> A big help in making those dreams a reality is the Food Education Fund, a New York City nonprofit that works with three partner public schools like this one on funding, training, and placement in area restaurants. Sean Feeney is the fund's co-chair. Today is their first shot. The lights go on, and this is they get that taste of taking care of others, feeding others, making people feel great after they leave us even better. So it's an exciting program for us, and hopefully they love it so much that they do become interns, they become team members of restaurants, and it's something they do for the rest of their life. It starts today. The Food Education Fund currently reaches about 860 public high school students, 97% of whom are minorities. And in the last five years, every single graduate of their training program has been hired in an area restaurant. 20-year-old Romeo Malpica is one of those graduating chefs. 
He interned during his senior year and is now a line cook at Lilia in Brooklyn, focusing on pasta dishes and the grill. It's just that confidence of being able to do something when I'm asked to. It's like, okay, and now I'm building towards something, you know, building towards myself, bettering myself. Yeah, I think I think it's great, especially coming out of the pandemic to get these young kids in early and again to show them how to be successful in this industry show them that it can be a viable career path and that they can get a lot out of it. It's the first step for the next generation of chefs, continuing the love of food they learned from their parents and grandparents. That's how I knew I wanted to make people feel like this because she made me feel like this. Our next story spotlights a university with a purpose, putting higher education within the reach for people all around the world without sending students into debt. Al Roker had the chance to meet the man behind the mission. Take a look. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shai Reshef, and I'm the president of University of the People. In 2010, education entrepreneur Shai Reshef visited the people of Haiti to introduce himself and his novel idea. The University of the People is the first nonprofit, tuition free online university dedicated to open the gates to higher education for everyone. Shai spending his career in for-profit education, running test prep and computer training centers. Among other things, I started the first online university in Europe. That's where I saw how powerful online learning can be. When he sold his company in 2005 and semi-retired, Shai wanted to give back. He saw learning as the perfect opportunity. Shai shelling out $1 million of his own money to make his vision a reality. I believe that higher education is a basic right for all. And I believe that there wasn't a better reason for the invention of the internet than bringing education to people wherever they are. His innovative model to provide affordable and accessible higher education to anyone who wanted it, regardless of their financial circumstances. And now is one of the fastest growing online universities in the world, with more than 117,000 students from 200 countries and territories. Our largest country is the U.S., but we have students from Africa, we have students from Asia, and we have a lot of refugees. We took more refugees than any university in the world. We have people who are uh, stay-home moms, unemployed, undocumented, people who simply work and cannot accommodate uh, the rigid schedule of universities, and they come to us, they have the flexibility. That's exactly what drew Elise Deer to University of the People. The Colorado native had no college education and no clear career path, but she had higher aspirations. Through a Google search, she stumbled upon University of the People. Before I had my first child, I was looking for an opportunity to attend college and I didn't want to go into an extreme amount of debt to receive higher education. I wouldn't have been able to do a traditional program where I needed to sit in a classroom because I had two children. So I was filling in my study time in, during nap time. Last year, Elise graduating with a bachelor's degree in business administration, now working as a software person at a huge tech company. Without University of People, I certainly wouldn't be at the company that I work for. I certainly would not be uh, really in a dream career. With a 92% job placement rate, University of the People uses a full faculty of volunteers, all with a common goal. We have teachers, professors that are coming from the best universities of the world with the desire to help students who need education and cannot get it. And it's very simple. When you help someone, you get so much more to yourself, to your heart. His heartfelt message is what has helped his students succeed both in school and as members of society. We had different opinions on what was important, so it helped me to really have a global mindset in terms of my future role and the future jobs I would take on and also just how I view day-to-day -day life. Shai estimates doubling enrollment by 2025, and he says that's just the beginning. I hope that one day every single person in the world will have the opportunity for higher education. If we are succeeding in doing that, not only that the students will have better futures and their families and their community, we will have a better world. Coming up, do not miss the surprise we have in store for two friends headed to college. It's right after the break.
Welcome back to The Boost. Meet Louisa and Cindy, two friends who are headed off to college for the first time. As they got ready for their adventure, Jenna and I shared a special surprise when they stopped by Studio 1A. But first, take a look at their journey. My name is Luisa Bautista, and I am going to Boston College. I'm really excited for me to get to this point. There was a lot of sacrificing, a lot of tears. I used to tell my mom, look, the most important thing to me is coming to the United States to pursue my education. My mom brought me here for a better opportunity. When I first came here, my grades were not great. I did not know English. I was bullied a lot because of my accent. I felt like I didn't belong. But then teachers and faculty members um, and students started talking to me and showing me things and teaching me different ways that educated me to who I am now. I want to pursue in college criminal justice and political science and then transition to law school. I want to be a prosecutor uh, mainly for cases that have to do with domestic abuse. As a person that have been through that, I know how it feels not having the right legal representation for those type of cases. So I do want to help my community and my people to be able um, to get that justice. By Lucia's side throughout this process is Cindy Queller. Together on this journey, the two have formed a beautiful friendship. Hi, my name is Cindy Queller. I'm going to Boston University. I'm super excited. I never thought that I would say that. It was my dream. It's just so crazy. I came to the United States about like three years ago. I wanted to get like bigger opportunities, I would say, and I wanted to get a new experience. Leaving Colombia was a whole journey for me. At first, I was super excited, but then as I came here, I was like, oh my God, like I miss my mom, I miss my country, I miss my people. It's been super hard. I feel that um, my mom has always been that. She has always said, I know you can do it. Because sometimes I doubt myself. I can be like, oh my God, do I really deserve this? Am I really gonna make it? But she can be like, no, I know you're gonna make it. I'm here for you. I found that I am able to do amazing things and to accomplish amazing things. Once I graduate, I wanna go back, help my people. I wanna empower where I come from. I wanna empower who I am. And I just wanna showcase everyone who I am and the diversity that I hold. <laughs> Oh, oh, we're so happy. We want to say congratulations to you both. Louisa, Boston College, Cindy, BU. Guys, can you just tell us, you know you're going to your <laughs> dream college. Just what does it feel like? It feels excited. It feels like a dream. Like, I'm still dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> what you've done yeah. in the last five years yes. to get yes. where you are now. Yeah. It's a long journey. I'm so excited. I'm going to be next to her, too, because we're, we're going, rivals. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be together. It's just amazing. I, I wonder, how mm -hmm. have you all supported each yeah. other? Because Ooh. coming to this country mm -hmm. uh, can't be easy. You miss mm -hmm. your mom. I know oh, you yes. do. Yes. Um, how have you all supported each other through this process? Well, we became friends junior year. She was a transfer from classical mm -hmm. um, to our school. And I remember I was having a tough um, situation and year in our school. So literally, as she was sitting alone in, in lunch, and I'm like, I'm gonna go talk to her. She was alone, and I sat down with her, and from there, Boom. just clicked. It was just, <laughs> I mean, when you talk about feeling left out or feeling bullied, how did you, how did you make your way through that difficult part of school? Um, yeah. When I first came to the United States, um, I didn't speak in, any English. Um, when I first came to you, I try to like speak it or like try to like, you know, engage with people yeah. in, in the language, but people didn't like engage with that. They were like, oh, she is from another country. And they bully me because of how I spoke, my accent. They interfere with that a lot. Um, so it was really hard. I used to cry to my mom every day and I'm like, yeah, like I need to go back to my country. Like, I don't feel safe here. Like, I don't want to wow. be here. Um, so I never thought I was gonna get to where I am now. You know yeah. what, that's yeah. because of y'all's grit and yeah. determination, your hard work, and also I'm sure the teachers at KIPP, where you go in Massachusetts, yeah. how did they make you feel seen? Yeah. Amazing, they're like amazing. Like we have the support that we need, like they're always gonna be there. Our counselors, our teachers, the staff is just like so amazing. Like I'm so glad that I came mm -hmm. to KIPP oh. and that I got to meet so like 
Amazing people, so many amazing people. Well, you have, we have some of your loved ones here, yes, as you we know. Have. We've got your, your dad, Cindy, and your yeah. mom. Come on come. out. <laughs> come on. You want to sit next to your, everyone sit yeah, next to their lovey. Next to your loved one. <laughs> yeah. Are, God, are you guys so proud? How proud are you of your little girl? I thank you guys for my daughter. I am so proud for my daughter. Oh. <laughs> Marco, I, I, I know that um, she doesn't get to be with her mom, mm -hmm. but uh, how does it feel to watch your little girl soar? Oh, amazing. Uh, it amazes me to see how she has uh, uh, overcome her challenges yeah. during these years in high school. Well, we also have yeah. a little message, Cindy, for you yeah. from your mom. Oh so can we take a look? I really love you. I miss you. But I'm so proud of you for your work. God bless you. Don't forget, I love you. Te amo mucho, hija. Cuídate. Bye. Okay, we're all crying. Te amo mucho. What does that mean just to hear her? Oh my God. It's. I can describe it like I just talked to her this morning and she was like, you got this girl. Oh, you got it. Well, you we have a little this. something else, a little bit of news for you. You yes. guys don't know this, but we're about to reveal something to you. You are both recipients of Kip's Goldberg Scholarship. <laughs> You're each going to receive $60,000. $60, <laughs> <laughs> the scholarship is provided by the Sandberg Goldberg Berthel <laughs> Family Foundation. Um, so you have $60,000 going to your four years. Which so. I know that college has gotten so <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing, like, oh my God, I can't oh believe it. God. I'm so oh grateful. God. I can describe it with words. Oh my oh God. I'm so happy. Will that take a lot of pressure off of you all? Yes, it did. Uh, man, um, come in here. <laughs> um, we also have to tell you, you also will be matched with a mentor yes. who is a successful leader in their field. Yeah. And you'll have support and network and help you get internships and job opportunities. So, so there'll be somebody who, is, who has succeeded in your field who's going to hold your hand and walk you through to make sure that you guys are successes, oh too. And y'all are our future leaders. Yes. We're so proud of you. And, we're, and, and thank you to the parents. Y'all are amazing. <laughs> Thank you, guys. All your thank sacrifices. You. We love you. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Love thank you. you. Oh. Love you. Oh. So happy. That was so <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. Coming up after the break, we're getting cheesy with a one-of-a-kind boot camp. Stick around. the boost. So Jenna and I recently paid a visit to Murray's Cheese. It's right here in New York City. 
for a cheese boot camp. So from slicing and plating to choosing pairings, let's just say it was an adventure that we could sink our teeth into. Check it out. I have a very intimate relationship with cheese. I have a new love of cheese, a recent love. As a little child, I would go to parties and run around and try to eat all the cheese cubes. Not knowledgeable at all. I think I'm a cheese expert. And the most important cheese. part cheese. of the dinner, yeah. cheese. the cheese. My queso recipe, one that is gourmet, is on the line. I know, I don't like the real stinky ones. Ever since I had that first bite of string cheese, that was my gateway drug. I like sharp cheddar. I like Yarsburg, however you pronounce it, Yarsburg. Yars. Yarlsburg. <laughs> now you're just showing off over there. You know it? The truffle cheddar. The truffle cheddar? This is gonna be the best day of my life. Inter Murray's, a world-renowned cheese destination and New York City staple since 1962. They say this is the spot. I feel like this is the Temple Day cheese. Temple Day cheese, this is your home. Do you smell that? Yes, I do. Ah. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. I'm Hoda. Elizabeth. How are you? Welcome, I'm Jenna. Hoda. I may Jenna. be your biggest fan. Oh, we are so thrilled to have you. Welcome to Murray's. We're groupies. You ready for boot camp? We boot are. Boot camp, but we don't have to plank or anything. No. Well, there's going to be some drills. Okay. There are? Cheese drills? <laughs> Gee whiz. Okay, <laughs> Good right. one. So before we get started, yeah. I want to give you a taste of two of our favorite cheeses. Oh, okay. okay. They are aged right here in our caves in Long Island City and are award winners. What do you mean caves? So we have cheese caves in Long Island City, by temperature and humidity controlled spaces. Ah. Do you ever let people sleep in those? Uh, it's a little damp and cool. Oh, yes. That one's a cheddar. Yeah, mm -hmm. Stocking Hall is a cloth-bound cheddar. Mm -hmm. It is an award-winning cheese. That's really good. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's it was time to enter the classroom, Cheese 101. In a typical two-day boot camp, guests eat up to three pounds of cheese. We were up for the challenge. Well, this is the school I've always meant to go to. So what we're gonna cover in today's session mm -hmm. is how to cut cheeses and then how to pair don't, them. Don't, please don't. She's the class clown. <laughs> no, you are. No, you whip you like this to cheese. me. You, no, I don't. Is that a manchego? This is a manchego. Okay. Uh, gold star for you, Jenna. Uh -huh. From Spain? Double gold star. Oh, you know what? I'm just gonna teach you a really quick trick. For the seltzer share or any disc-shaped cheese, what I like to do, especially if I'm plating for a board, is to cut about a quarter of the cheese right out, uh -huh. and then place it yeah. on top. Oh, oh, lovely. Okay. Looks beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. Our next lesson, the three main principles of cheese parry. You guys are gonna repeat after me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Opposites attract. Opposites attract. Like goes with like. Like goes with like. And what grows together goes together. What grows together goes together. Bravo. A plus gold stars for both of you. Thank you. After pairing and, of course, more tasting, we were ready to get our hands dirty and make our own mozzarella. So okay. we are using that hot water. It's melting the curds. Wow, I feel it happening. This I is like a science too. experiment. You're gonna make the okay sign like this with your palm up. You're gonna plop that curd right into it and use the thumb of your other hand to push it through. Whoa. Oh, we're Just making show. a bunch balls. of balls. Yeah, you, you can make what? one big one or a bunch of little you can ones. Make a big, you, if you'd to like to make balls. a big one, no, then you can Jenna, make a big one, Hoda. Jenna. Here, you try a bite of that. This <laughs> is beautiful, Hoda. You made a really lovely one. We think Hoda takes the cake on this I one. I think Hoda oh. wins the Metro no, making think... experience. You do. Thank you for having us. Cheers. Cheers. To cheese. cheese. To cheese. Cheese. To your mozzarella making careers. Do you like queso? I love queso. Oh, see. We have so much in common. You all have Belveda. <laughs> Speaking of cheesy, the hosts of our third hour got together for a lesson in pizza making. They're sharing the secret sauce behind the perfect pie. Take a look. All right, guys, we are at Pizza School New York City. Thought we'd maybe grab a little slice of life. Uh -huh. Oh, that's cheesy. Very cheesy. Oh, Extra let's cheese. Go. Let's go. Class was in session at Pizza School NYC. For over 13 years, founders Mark and Jenny Bello have guided students through the basics of making the perfect pie. To date, they've made over 100,000. I've never made my own pizza. In your life? Not really. Oh, really? You've Not never made your own pizza? No, actually, we've done it maybe oh, yeah. once or twice. Taking it out of the box and out of the fridge. Yeah. After we washed our hands and suited up, it was time for school to begin. Or as we like to say, we're gonna give you this information uh, on a knead the dough basis. Oh, oh, that's... oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 
I'm gonna show you guys how to make dough. All right. All right. All right. So first thing is um, we have our yeast. To activate the yeast, uh, in this case, because we're going to be making what's called a quick rise dough, we're going to use some warm water. Okay. okay. Temperature, roughly 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You're 98.6 degrees on a good day, right? It feels warm to the that touch. Dylan, she's just yeah. colder than that. Oh, <laughs> wow. I knew that, knew that would happen All right. <laughs> After stirring the yeast and water together, we added a bit of sugar, some flour, tablespoon of salt, and olive oil. We're doing a method we call the castle and moat method. What I want you guys to do is push your flour to the center of the bowl, okay. like you're making a sand castle. All flour in the center. And then you've got that moat around the perimeter. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and add that liquid into your moats. Okay. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna storm the castle. All right. Oh, storm in the castle. Storm the castle. Storm in the castle. Right. Wow, a group of class clowns was in need of some new material. Well, can you over need this too much? Or? Yes, you can. Yeah. You are can it be yeah. too needy? Yes. You are over needy. Yeah. No, you're yeah. good. You guys are good. How does it look, Mark? You have not gone past the point of dough return. <laughs> oh! He's here till Thursday. <laughs> Weddings and bar mitzvahs. We cut our dough into fourths, sealing it away for about 45 minutes so it could rise to the occasion. Soon, it was time to stretch. The stretching technique. Yeah. Uh, 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 on the same page. We have come up with a mnemonic, two words that has changed the dough stretching life of tens of thousands of people. <laughs> we call this soft bongos. Soft bongos. Oh. Yes. So watch. So what I'm doing oh. here. I hear the rhythm. So soft. <laughs> soft the bongos. softest bongos right here. Next stretching technique, we call this gravity. Gravity. You hold the edge oh, and you turn the dough. We even learned the art of the toss. Mark took our topping orders and encouraged us to think outside the pizza box. I'm gonna do anchovies with basil. I'm going to do uh, mushrooms and then I'll top it with basil. Top it with basil, okay, cheese-wise. Are we going shreds like I had? You wanna do a fresh? What would you do? We have fresh mozzarella. I'll do fresh. The bomb. Mm, sausage, peppers, and mushrooms. Okay, and what kind of cheese? Shredded cheese. Shreds? Okay, you got it. Mark, I'm gonna do sausage, mushrooms, and shreds. Yes. It. Cool. Yeah. When we launched our pies into the oven, it was history in the baking. Here we go. All right. Wish me luck, guys. Great, oh, great. Wish me luck. Great. 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 Finally, the moment of truth. Tasting a pizza are hard work. Okay, here you go, guys. Nice. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Yeah. To pizza making. That's really good. That's cool. Oh, that's good. Mm. Oh, As we like to say, you've all graduated oh. uh, mozzarella cum laude. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Four perfect pies, even though the people weren't. Coming up, we got the latest viral video that'll boost your day. Stay with us.
the boost, we have one more video that's sure to brighten your day. Check it out. When Trevor's older sister joined the Marine Corps, he took it pretty hard. He missed having her around. So this is his reaction when she came home to surprise him after they'd been apart for nearly a year. Come walk around this way. Open up the front door. That's what it's like in my house when I get back from L.A. Yeah. Like a week. Right. By the way, is that, is that amazing? Uh, that God, that's a bond right there. Oh, that's a beautiful, beautiful. Trevor. Oh, wow. Gorgeous. Adorable. That is all for today. We hope we're able to start your day off with a little boost of positivity. And guess what? We will see you tomorrow with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day. Hello and thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential here on Today All Day. I'm Vicki Wynn. From finding affordable housing to battling gray hair and even new service to shuttle your teens around, we have something for everyone. But first, many of us are looking for ways to live longer and feel healthier as we age. Could the answer be found in so-called longevity clinics? They're not cheap. To see what they're like, I checked into a longevity clinic right here in Manhattan. The aging process dead in its tracks. Unlike in the movie Death Becomes Her, drinking a magic potion won't make you live forever. I'm a girl. But that doesn't mean we aren't obsessed with living longer. Even celebrities like the health benefits of full body scans to Hoda on today. That you have to be the CEO of your health. Longevity medicine is the business of helping people live healthier, longer lives. Last year, it topped $26 billion in the U.S. I'm here outside the Princeton Longevity Center in Manhattan to give you a look at what happens. But first, I had to fill out an extensive health questionnaire. Everything from my eating habits to my sleeping habits to my family's medical history. And we are here bright and early today because this whole experience is gonna take about eight hours. Welcome to Princeton Longevity Center. After check-in, I'm taken to my private lounge where I'll rest between medical exams and tests. Okay, I'm told the first thing we're doing this morning is getting my vital signs. They're gonna draw some blood. They're checking my hormone levels. They're gonna look at kidney and liver function. And they're doing it all this morning so that we can get the results by this afternoon. Pretty quick turnaround. I'm getting a bone density and body scan to measure my bone strength and muscle mass. Blood draws to screen for things like genetic cancer markers, cholesterol, and vitamin deficiencies. Oh, last one already? You're on the last one. Yay. A test of my resting metabolic rate to see how many calories I burn just by existing. So when I'm resting, my body's burning a, 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 a thousand calories. Around a thousand, around a thousand, a thousand calories. calories. And a standard physical. Ever been told you snore? No, I don't think I snore. Dr. David Fine founded the Princeton Longevity Center in 2001 to help people optimize their health with nutrition, exercise, and medical care with the hope of living longer and better. Who makes an ideal patient? Because for some people, knowing what's coming down the road can make them more anxious and more stressed. On the one hand, that's true. On the other hand, though, you have two choices. You can find out what's going on or it can find you. Where is the sweet spot where some things may resolve on their own versus I'm going in and doing so much intervention and some of it may not be necessary. Well, you know, certainly a lot of things do resolve on their own. What we're really looking for really are more of the things that are going to be the chronic diseases of getting older. Your risk of diabetes, your risk of heart attacks and strokes, your, your cancer risk, for example. My day continues with a CT scan of my heart and body. A few tests down, a few more to go. Nearly three and a half hours later. Breakfast at last. A quick bite and a cardiac stress test with a sports physiologist. This is definitely aptly named stress test. 
then a vision and hearing test. Next up is the ultimate athlete stress test. I thought that walking thing was hard. I think this is going to be really rough. The price you have to pay if you want to be an athlete. <laughs> what if you're just a reporter? I'm hooked up to the same machine used by Olympic athletes to measure my oxygen output and heart health. You got it, you got it. The view from the top, unbeatable. But after 10 minutes with the speed and incline creeping up, I'm beat. Ah, I survived it, barely. I get my results quickly. Your act, heart is acting like a 28 year old. But when I meet with the nutritionist who reviewed my food logs, she tells me to beef up my protein intake. Out of all your calories, only 15% is coming from protein. How much so should be coming? It should be 30 to 40. Oh, wow. Yes. Then I get the verdict on my overall health. On the whole, you're actually in really good health. Dr. Fine says the scans did find the bone density in my hips is below normal, and my body fat percentage was above average at 36%. He recommended weight-bearing exercise and strength training. It's time to pump exactly. me up. Mm. Then an unexpected result. You had a small nodule okay. over here in your left lung. It's this little guy right there. Wow, okay. Dr. Fine says it's likely a harmless lymph node, but recommended I get scanned in a year to check for growth. We don't yet have a lot of data on the experiences of people who are taking up these new services. Dan Belsky is a professor at Columbia University's Butler Aging Center. If someone doesn't have the time or frankly the money to invest in a screening like the one I underwent, what do you tell them to do? Eat a healthy diet, exercise, fill your life with things that matter to you. A social network surrounding and supporting you, that can be incredibly important for building healthy longevity. If you want to try it, Belsky says, talk to your primary care doctor about the tests you want to take, research the facility and provider credentials, and avoid untested procedures that promise anti-aging effects. So the, the big question, can you tell me how long I'm gonna live? You are certainly younger biologically than you are chronologically. We will get to the Smucker's Jar. And as a result of my visit, I've actually changed a lot of my habits. I've purchased a weighted vest. It's six pounds. I wear it when I walk to help increase the bone density in my hips. I've also upped my protein take by adding things like fish, turkey jerky, and protein shakes to my weekly meals. But again, these clinics, they're not cheap. My visit cost about $5,000. Some of these longevity clinics offer services throughout the entire year though. That can go for $60,000 or more. A lot of it is not covered by insurance, so always ask ahead of time. Now we turn to another hot topic, anti-gray hair products. According to Advanced Dermatology, 30% of Americans say they spend the most money on their hair color. It can be tempting to try a product that promises to reduce or delay gray hair, but do they really work? Call it 50 shades of anti-gray. One of the hottest hair care trends for those looking to hold back the hands of time. I recently found this gray hair treatment. We're hoping for the best. It's supposed to go deep into the scalp to the bulb and restore the hair color. All you have to do is target your gray areas. Some sharing their experience on social media, trying popular serums and supplements, promising to delay the gray. This is what it looks like. I'm also not ready. Just apply it kind of in lines. For any salt with my pepper. Feels nice. If anything, I'm at least getting a scalp massage. With 6 to 23% of the world's population showing at least 50% gray hair coverage by age 50, in the past year, search interest in anti-gray hair serum climbing 280% in the U.S. alone. We just have to kind of accept some facts of life, and gray hair is one of them. Dr. Mona Gohara is a board-certified dermatologist. What causes gray hair? We're all born with a certain number of hair follicles and a predetermined number of hair follicle cycles. There are little pigment producing factories in our hair follicles called melanocytes that give us our hair color. Sometimes the melanocytes get tired, they just don't wanna work anymore. And that's when our hair turns gray. She says anti-gray products aim to stimulate those melanocytes. Do they work? Can I make a joke and say it's kind of in the gray zone? <laughs> Whether the melanocytes are actually nudged is questionable. I don't know that we have any definitive science to say that that's actually happening. One well-known plant-based serum containing ingredients like caffeine, peptides, and vitamins promises to deliver real, visible results in as soon as 90 days. 
According to its website, the company behind the serum bases the statement on a three-month clinical study of 15 participants, of which 64% reported seeing less gray hair. For best results, the brand also recommends using its Gray Delay Supplement, a blend of vitamins, antioxidants, minerals, and botanicals described as ideal for those with little to no gray hair. While the Food and Drug Administration does not review anti-gray hair products for safety before they hit the market, Ohara considers them low risk for side effects, which could include irritation from serums or gastrointestinal issues with supplements. They're pretty safe, and that's why I think it's okay to try it on a small area. But she says check with your doctor before trying them. While prices vary per product, serum and supplement combos can cost $70 to $140, with most brands offering a discounted price when you sign up for a monthly subscription. Gohara says before spending your money, look to the root of the problem. It is 100% about our genetics. Now, there are other things that can give us gray hair, Vicky. There are some- Like my kids. That, yeah, oh, definitely. Your teenagers. <laughs> In a statement to NBC News, Vegamore says their serum helps reduce the appearance of grays on new hair growth, and their supplement helps preserve the hair's natural pigment and delays grays. All right, coming up, think twice before posting photos online. The unintended consequences of a photo post. back with a warning about photo fakes as more of us rely on online connections professionally and personally. How do you know who you're really talking to? Is that profile picture the real person? It's a problem that's becoming more common. Here are the red flags you need to watch for. How many of you have been threatened by someone who's upset thinking they know you? All of you. They're young, they're good looking, and they're on social media. Kayla, Cammie, Tristan, and Justin say scammers have stolen their images to create fake online profiles and then use those profiles to lure people into online relationships, grooming them into sending money. I had a family contact me and they wanted me to inform their grandfather like that it wasn't me that he was talking to. Is this something you have to deal with every day? Yeah, 100%. All say their photos now live on hundreds, even thousands of fake social media profiles, many times using their real names. I've actually been contacted by like the FBI, NCIS, basically confirming that I'm not behind all of this. These women, they spend thousands of dollars thinking I'm gonna come see them. Justin says he saw a post online, a woman celebrating her engagement to him. He messaged her and warned her husband-to-be wasn't real. Then the scammer saw Justin's comment. The scammer calls me and he's like, you're messing with my business. And I'm like, it's my face. This is not your business. Justin recorded the call. Oh, everybody but this poor girl, right? What did you say? Well, no. Tristan, a fitness coach, says some women who thought they were having an online relationship with him even hired him for in-person training. 
They just want to confirm that it's actually me, and then they'll just waste my time. Cybercrime continues to rise in America. Last year, reports of romance scams alone amounted to a reported loss of $1.3 billion. Among the top lies used to ask for money, someone close is sick, hurt, or in jail, and I am in the military. Three of these four have served or are serving. I think that military personnel are targeted because you can use the excuse because of security concerns. I can't send you a picture right now. I'm not allowed to video chat. California-based Social Catfish is a people search engine that focuses on online safety. Their search results help customers find and remove fake profiles. The internet's still the wild, wild west. There are very few laws to protect you online for the use of your images. CEO David McClellan says these stolen images can lead to very real danger. I had people actually showing up and, you know, getting getting upset with me in person. And it's even happened to me. Vicki, we decided to run your image and here's what we found. We found a Vicky Wynn channel selling for $799. We also found a clubhouse link of somebody actually using your image to most likely talk to other people online. And we found a celebrity foot website that has all your feet pics. My feet? That is gross and weird. McClellan says you can take steps to protect your images. Set your social media profiles to private. Limit what you post. Add watermarks to your photos and run reverse image searches. It's free with Google Images. If you can't meet the person within like a week, it's not real. By the way, those websites that were found with my pictures, Social Catfish has helped me take those down. And a few good reminders, never send money to someone you haven't met. Anytime someone online asks you for money, stop contact with them immediately and report that to the FTC. Artificial intelligence technology is also making it easier for scammers. A simple phone call is all it takes to extort money. The FBI says on average, victims of schemes using new voice technology lose about $11,000 each and recently scams have reached a new level with AI clones that look and sound like real celebrities spreading fake messages online. Today we are launching an investment project that... From Elon Musk pitching an investment opportunity to Gail King promoting a weight loss product. Follow the link right now and learn more about my secret. It seems fake ads made with AI are everywhere. Even Tom Hanks has found himself an unwilling spokesperson, warning his Instagram followers, there's a video out there promoting some dental plan with an AI version of me. I have nothing to do with it. While celebrity endorsement scams are nothing new, in the age of AI, these deceitful deep fakes are becoming more convincing, fooling those who buy into them. The FBI says last year victims lost a record $10.2 billion to scams and other online crimes. With just a few seconds of audio, new artificial intelligence software can clone a person's voice. As an actor, I pretend for a living. As an actor, I pretend for a living. And a scammer can make it say anything. The Federal Trade Commission issuing a recent warning that voice cloning technology is making family emergency scams more convincing. Earlier this year, several Oregon school districts warned parents about a spate of fake kidnapping calls. A recent global survey showed one in four people saying they've experienced an AI voice cloning scam or knew someone who had. I got a phone call from an unknown number, and so I pick up the phone and I say hello, and my daughter Brianna says, Mom, and she's crying and sobbing. Jennifer DeStefano says she was convinced her 15-year-old daughter, Brianna, had been kidnapped. And uh, she says, Mom, these bad men have me. Help me, help me, help me. She fades off as man takes over the phone and says, listen here, I've got your daughter. She says the scammer threatened to harm her daughter unless she sent him a million dollars. How much did it sound like your daughter? It sounded, I never doubted it was her. I, I had a full conversation with her. It was the way she cries, it was the way she sobs, it was the way she would respond to me. Jennifer was able to connect with her husband, who confirmed Brianna was safe. After warning her friends and neighbors, Jennifer says she's heard of similar incidents. Whether it was a kidnapping, whether it was an accident, you know, they were in jail, all these different types of scenarios. We're going to have a completely new group of scammers and threat actors. Wasim Khalid is CEO and co-founder of Blackbird AI. 
I saw that in some of these voice cloning programs are as cheap as $5 a month. And you can take someone's voice off of a social media video, use AI and make that voice say whatever you want it to do. Is that really happening? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's basically the, the revolution in AI over the last six months. The key takeaway here is generative AI is going to be the catalyst to drive misinformation, disinformation, and warped realities further and faster than we've ever seen before. He says if you get a suspicious call about a family emergency, first authenticate the person by having them confirm information only you two would know. Have a private safe word for your family and have someone else call your loved one's actual phone number. Because with AI, what you see and hear is not always what you get. Up next, a new Uber feature that allows teens to order their own rides. Consumer Confidential continues right after the break. Popular rideshare Uber has a new feature that could make things a lot easier for busy parents. Have you ever had a child stuck at school while you're at work and unable to pick them up? Introducing Uber for teens. Good morning, boys and girls, and welcome to what we're sure will be our greatest year at Rydell. As classic as the movie Grease, so is the ritual of returning to class. And with it comes hectic teen schedules. School, sports practice, band, even going to the mall. Solving the riddle of all those rides can be worse than a wordle. I should know, my own teenage daughter Emerson is as busy as ever. So we're trying out Uber for Teens. It's a new service that allows teens to order their own rides. It starts here on my phone in the Uber app. Teens can actually create an account on their own. A parent or guardian has to invite them. So you go to your Uber app, hit account, and then family and teens, Right there, invite family, and there it is, add a teen. The app, designed for teens 13 to 17, sends Emerson an invite, and from there, she creates her own teen account after reading a safety tutorial. Uber says parents should talk to their teens before they use the service, remind them to check the license plate, ask the driver who they're picking up before getting in, and never sit in the front seat. I'm ordering my ride now. Here I am at work and I just got a text. Yep, it's a notification. It says Emerson just requested a ride and the driver is arriving in four minutes. The car pulls up. Hey, how are you? Who are you here for? Um, Emerson. Yep, yeah, all right. But the driver can't start the ride without a personal identification number or PIN from Emerson's app to ensure she's in the right car. We will have uh, one uh, PIN for me. The PIN is six 
two, five, five. She's on her way while I follow along from my office. It shows me Emerson's been picked up and it shows me she'll be dropped off in seven minutes. I can even call the driver to check in. Is Emerson in the car with you? Yes, ma'am. She is here. Great. Is everything going okay? Everything perfect, ma'am. Just perfect. Hey, Emerson, are you there? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Everything's good on your end? Going great. Uber says drivers with teen passengers can't change drop-off locations, and if the drive goes off course or stops for extended periods of time, Uber will call the driver and teen, and if necessary, 911. Uber Vice President Sachin Kansal notes the safety features are mandatory and cannot be turned off. Our kids are very precious cargo. For parents, the most important thing was visibility and tracking. Can any driver drive teens or do they have to go through a vetting process? They have to be an experienced driver on our platform and they have to be positively rated throughout. In addition, Uber says it conducts criminal background checks and reviews driving records every year, providing a new option for busy parents just in time for the start of school. Thanks for the ride. We also tried the new Uber Eats feature for teens multiple times, but we did experience a few glitches from not getting notifications to receiving the wrong order. Uber tells us that this feature is still being tested and developed. Coming up, the latest housing trend, what to know about build to rent communities that are popping up across the country. Imagine living in a three or four bedroom home, two car garage and a backyard without all the responsibilities of home ownership. Introducing build to rent communities, entire neighborhoods of single family homes built just for renting. They're popping up across the country and they're already helping to alleviate the national housing shortage. The American dream isn't for sale, it's for rent in this community near Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to Harmony Heights, 153 and four bedroom single family homes, all brand new and part of the build to rent trend. Renters enjoy modern appliances and luxury finishes, spacious closets and smart home technology. An app allows them to request fixes. Their monthly rent and a small fee cover all maintenance and landscaping. Think of an apartment complex, except you break it down into single family homes. Richard Ross is CEO of Quinn Residences. Who is renting these homes? A third of our residents are people who can't come up with a down payment. They can't afford seven, seven and a half percent mortgage today. But two thirds of our residents are residents by choice, meaning they elect to rent. While the median sales price for existing homes has dropped nearly 2% from last year, a recent report shows renting as more cost effective than home ownership in 95% of the U.S. right now. Here in the United States, there are almost a thousand of these build to rent communities with single family detached homes. More than 500 are in the works. Each community has 50 or more homes renting for an average of $2,000 a month. I never even heard of a community 
that was strictly a rental community. So I was pretty intrigued by it. Luke and Rebecca Montgomery spent a year looking to buy a home, but struggled to find anything within their price range and big enough for their family. Then they found this neighborhood on Zillow. This is not the time to buy or, or build. We would rather wait it out a little bit and see what happens. So this was just the right solution for us. How nice is it to have the benefits of home ownership without the responsibility? It's nice to be able to know that in the event something happens, it's not all going to fall on your shoulders. I can find myself very bored. I don't have to cut the grass. Empty nesters Marco and Myra Martinez says the low maintenance lifestyle gives them more time to enjoy the things they love. I love to hear the birds uh, singing and to see the trees uh, behind my house. It's beautiful. A career change prompting their move from Texas. The couple says instead of buying, they decided to rent so they could see if they liked the area first. This community offered us a, a great opportunity to rent a house where we feel safe. You don't have to own all the time. I mean, you can make the decision of renting and, and, and thinking about it. And sometimes that's better than just uh, owning. You can use an online calculator like one of these to see if it makes sense for you to rent or buy in a particular location. People are taking a different path to home ownership. David Howard, CEO of the National Rental Home Council, says Build to Rent provides an innovative way to introduce supply into the housing market, which is an estimated 6 million homes short. What does it mean when it comes to affordability? It is almost $1,000 less expensive on average to rent a single family home than to make a mortgage payment on a single family home. When considering Build to Rent, experts say do your homework. Look for reputable developers. You can search those affiliated with the National Rental Home Council at buildforrenthomes.com. Also, think about location and if the community matches your family's lifestyle. Tips to help you lay the foundation for your version of the American dream. That is our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement. Like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960. Or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists. And Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Dookie Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eater is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Dickie Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duke Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dickie Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po' boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase, 
Jr. and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African-American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chases when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dukey. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding 
Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We are enjoying everything. everything. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase to get myself some gumbo. When the service is right, they treat you nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, Food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trines Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. 
As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, according to Professor Psyche Williams Porson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks who are in the North, they still experience poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzie Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken. Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see it's you. Been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After 
Yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored. I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you and the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. No, is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, See yeah. How gentle he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. Now this now is you're worth, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're going person. for. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect? Wow, the seasoning is moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I can come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at b and Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists UEP Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting our pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward, but how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to The Boost. We're starting off your day with a spark of joy. First up, cuteness overload at a nursing home that's bringing together old and young using toddlers to help residents reconnect with their inner child. Once a week, Rena Shinohara heads off to work, clocking in for a shift at the Ichiwan Nursing Home for a job you could say she was born to do. Rena is one of the home's baby workers, a pint-sized team of professionals hired to spend time with elderly residents. Being cute is a full-time occupation here, the task to make the days a little brighter. It energizes me to see them, so this really helps me, says Tutsuo Ojiro, who's 93. His own grandkids don't come around much anymore. The idea of hiring babies came about after the nursing home's director brought her own granddaughter to work. It's a lot of when I saw the elderly people smile, I realized the power possessed by infants, says Kimi Gondo. So she advertised for recruits, Hi. up to three years old, who can't yet speak well to keep conversations simple. Requirements are pretty loose. Babies work when they want to and stroll around with a parent. She gets to interact with grandmothers and grandfathers, says Rena's mother. It's funny, I'm not working, but she has a job. Rina, do you like your job? Yeah. <laughs> the patter of little feet around wheelchairs and walkers here is meant to ease the isolation that often comes with growing old. It's especially acute in Japan, where a third of the population is over age 65. Last year, the government even created a ministry of loneliness to help get reclusive people out, especially after the pandemic. They should be able to interact with people of all ages, she says. It's only natural. There are now 70 baby workers on staff here, giggling for 100 residents, making the home more of a hub. When they come, they're so cute, she says. Being a baby worker isn't always easy, though. And there's mandatory retirement before preschool. But it comes with a salary of diapers and ice cream and a rich payoff for residents, too. 
now to a remarkable school bus driver in Michigan, affectionately known as Miss Sparkles. She's making a difference in our community by greeting the kids who board her bus with words of wisdom and a reminder to always be kind. Teresa Weekly from our Grand Rapids affiliate WOOD TV has more. Here we go. This is not the magic school bus. Morning, Haley. There is, however, How are you, hon? a bit of magic on it. Haley's our hockey player. She's, uh, been, how long have you been playing hockey? Three years? It's in every smile. Wes tries to sneak by me, don't you, Wes? Yes. Yeah, a little slippery Sam. <laughs> every name remembered. Good morning, Ellie. Morning, Kata. Morning, Riley. How are you? Her ID badge says Lori, but the kids call her Miss Sparkles. I would wear, it was, you know, like 10 years ago, the sparkly stuff was all in, which it's all coming back now, which I'm so excited. Lori Brooks has been a bus driver in Granville Public Schools for 10 years. How do you remember everyone's name? Um, I think it is because it's important to me. And when it's important, um, I think it's easy. They say if you keep asking questions, you'll keep getting answers. And that seems to be one of Miss Sparkle's tricks. Hello, Levi. Hello, Judah. How are you? I hope I can just be that calm, safe zone for them to tell me good or bad and go from there. It doesn't matter what's going and on in her so, own world. Yeah, your life just changes so quick. She's the best bus driver ever. Miss Sparkles always shows up for the kids. Two years ago this week, she lost her husband. He had been paralyzed since their one-year wedding anniversary and died unexpectedly. I just have to believe it was his time to go. I know that when we got to the hospital, hospital that day, he said, I just can't do it anymore. Good morning, Amaya. Within a few days, she was back on the bus with the same contagious smile. I think sitting at home, just looking at things wasn't going to help me. Magic comes from what's inside you. Kindness is the cure, people, right? For Miss Sparkles, hey, you have a wonderful day. That means right. kindness. Oh, there, Gianna, you have a great day. Oh, and Amaya, too. You and a piece of her heart. Oh, lots of love I got, huh? <laughs> For the third hour of today, Craig went on the job at a business where they really value growth. And while it was hard work, he had a smile planted on his face all day. Even though my roots are firmly planted at the Today Show, I was looking forward to my first day as an employee at Terrain. What's up, Deb? I'm excited about my first day. Hey, Ooh. we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some I'm fun. Excited. Come on in. Come on in. After you, Let's go. Deb Herbertson is a supervisor in the design department. She's been working here for about 10 years. 
Why is it so here. I don't know. First, I put on my uniform. Is this where I put my tips? <laughs> <laughs> my tips? And got a quick tour so I could get the lay of the land in case any customers needed directions later on. Candles, of course, we oh, love our candles. Oh, I love the candles we here. We love our candles. We're just getting some neat seasonal ones in. These so are fall candles. Then, Deb handed me off to Peggy, a store associate who today is responsible for keeping the plants hydrated and healthy. This is a pitcher plant, so they love to stay moist. So you're going to water a little a bit in each That's plant. how you yeah. water the plant? you got to water it like that. What? Each one gets That's there too you much. go. Whoopsie. That's right. Still learning on the job training. Yeah. Right? And move down this way here. Take, yeah. Let's roll. Yeah, the roll, help me roll the cart. Yeah. This is a moisture meter. And oh. with any plant, you can see it says dry or wet. Got my moisture meter here. Stand there we by. go. I can tell you. And then you can also mist it. Oh, now that one says it's moist. So there you go. My first solo task testing and watering the rest of the plants in the atrium. That's bone dry. Can I put a little water in there? All right. Uh-oh, that may be a little much. That's okay, that's okay, Craig, that's okay. Boop, boop, boop. I'm not sure why I'm making that noise, but it seems appropriate. We'll just give them all a little, little spritz, a little shower. Need a little water there, buddy. Let's hope all these plants are still alive tomorrow. Mission accomplished. Next up, flexing my creative muscles over at the design bench with Deb. Okay. So, the real work begins. Back here is where we make the things for the floor. We make beautiful arrangements for people to come by. Here's your model. This kind of looks like, I don't know, that a cool- A succulent that... spaceship. Yes. Okay. I you like might... that. Like right there? Kind of yes. Tuck right in, baby. So, any piece we're making, we always want our eye to travel. You want a little bit of focal point. So, let's think of like this sweet- I this... was just looking oh, at that. Oh, he's like, whatever. I was just you, looking at that. Coil a little what do you bit. think, like right there? I think so. I think the pink might be a nice contrast. I think That's really one. pretty. I, I That's think. It's a color we don't really have yet. I know. You know, I'm going to say if this little morning gig you have doesn't work out, <laughs> I, I'm going to say you got a future here. Once I mastered plant design, it was time for my hardest assignment yet. Now we are a retail store. So no matter what, even if you're back here working in the trenches, you're going to be working with customers. Oh boy! So I think uh, now is the time to get you out there and let's uh, let's meet your public. Let's, let's, hit, let's, let's hit the let, floor. Let's let's work with some customers. Oh! Hi. Welcome to Terrain. Thank you. Very nice much. to meet you. I'm nice Craig. You. I'm Kathy. Nice to meet you. Kathy, what what can I help you with? So I want to get a gift for a friend of mine. Yep. And I'm not sure if I should get something like this. I'm going to have you fill out this request form. Oh, and, great, um, great, great, great. What's your, what are you looking to spend? 100? Might I suggest 400? No. <laughs> Here to help, sir, with the hat. Do you, need, do you have any questions? Candles are in the back. Which one do you like better? Which one's more expensive? Do you have your wallet? No. How are you going to pay for it? We only accept cash. You have cash? You're not gonna be able to take this out. No, you can't afford that. Get that back. Thank you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Welcome to Terrain. I just need to know what the ladies' room is. <laughs> the bathroom. Uh, yes, I know where the. So you're gonna you're gonna go that way. You're gonna make soon. The work day was winding down, but Deb had one last job for me. Earlier today, we had somebody call and say, "We're having a party." It's an outdoor party. Could we get a little something for our centerpiece yeah. outside? And I thought maybe this was going to be it. Do you want to make a delivery for Terrain? Yes! Our request came from Lindsay Melvin. <laughs> well, I will be taking this home yes. for a weekend party. All right, my friend. I love hey, that. Thank oh. you for everything. It was so much fun. Another satisfied customer. Nice work, Craig. All right, our time in the garden continues. Meet the woman helping people grow by getting their hands dirty. Gotti Schwartz has this story. If you wanted to plant a beautiful garden, you might not pick them all in LA, but with the help of this mobile nursery called the Oasis, it might be exactly where you end up. It almost seems like she is this entrance to a secret garden that you can transport anywhere. She is just that. Um, I love the idea of the secret garden because she's very personal. Created by Barbara Lawson, the van helps her direct people to where they can meet her in the dirt. The name of her one-of-a-kind gardening therapy sessions. So you're telling me that we are going to do gardening. We are going to connect with the ground inside of a mall. Absolutely inside that mall, but not just any experience. You just wait and see. For Barbara, a certified grief counselor, the root of sharing her love of plants runs much deeper. What inspired this dream? 
this particular dream about uh, Meet Me in the Dirt was uh, born in pain. Um, when I was 24, I lost my mother. Normally, you can move through that process of grieving uh, naturally, but after about 20 years of not dealing with that pain, um, I went into a deep depression, and Meet Me in the Dirt was born. We joined Barbara inside her South Bay Galleria sanctuary for a therapy session and watched her transform a table of strangers into a wellspring of well-being. I start by giving you journals because, yes, we're going to get dirty, but um, this work requires that we also do some of this work, meaning reflection. We are love. Strong, strong, intentional, intentional, sincere, sincere, sunshine, sunshine grateful, and yearning. and yearning. I'm loving all these words. So right behind you, and then take whatever time you need, there's an assortment of plants. I want you to get two babies that call your name. Exactly like my daughter. Oh, okay. This looks like a crazy hair. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's cute. <laughs> no plan is perfect unless it's fake. There is absolutely scientific proven facts that show us that digging in dirt releases stress, releases anxiety, and it helps us to heal. You have your pen, you have your journal. What is this good soil getting ready to represent in your life? Think about this nursery pot. What would happen if this baby stayed in this nursery pot? Your new environment is where you're gonna allow yourself to grow and to flourish beyond where you were. So sometimes in life, things have to come against you. Press, press all around. What is it that's doing that to you? What's squeezing you on all sides? As we worked through the session, it became obvious that the dirt symbolizes so much more. When I placed my first baby in the pot, she was leaning over and I wanted her to stand up <laughs> and I had to check myself in that moment and say it's okay for her to lean it's okay for her to get steady over time and it's very very parallel to some personal things that I'm dealing with right now so I'm trying to hold it together <laughs> but it's deeper when she was talking about how some of the leaves this is the plants way of, of shedding the toxicity yeah do you see beauty in that absolutely absolutely um, there's beauty in the growth, there's beauty in the shedding. When you look at it knowing what the plant's doing, all of a sudden it becomes beautiful. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. It reminds all you of yourself. Of in sharing, you actually become a very powerful person. Yes. That's right. Yes. If you're so afraid to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. when being vulnerable is actually incredible. And for an hour, we listen to the wisdom found in Mother Nature from a gardener of plants and a gardener of people. And when you're removing yourself out of that old nursery pot into your new environment, you just transition. We've connected with each other, we've shown each other love, we've added encouragement, we've made sure to tell ourselves that nothing blooms all year round.
back on the boost, Beyonce recently wrapped up her Renaissance World Tour, and now two of her most famous backup dancers are heading out on a tour of their own. Our girl Donna Farrison caught up with them to learn how they're harnessing the power of dance to spread an important message. They're among the most famous twins in the world. Laurent and Larry Bourgeois, better known as Les Twins, have undeniably got the moves. Most recently, dancing alongside Beyonce on her Renaissance World Tour. I caught up with the identical twins at the Gramercy Theater in New York City. Ah. You two just finished the Renaissance Tour. How are you feeling? I miss her. Yeah, already. I, I call her monster Beyonce. But Why? She, it's because she's a monster. She do one thing and it works. For 56 shows in 39 cities, on stage, they were Beyonce's left and right. He's the left arm and the right arm. Yeah. That's it. It's, it's, it's just how it is. No, the right is the left one. No, the right one, Larry. I was the right. You forget break my soul? Break my soul. I'm on the right side. And as I witnessed, the backup dancers still thicker oh, like brothers. Oh, the dancing duo grew up in Paris. The youngest of nine, they took an early interest in dance. And even with no formal training, they found major success. In 2010, they went viral for this video from the World of Dance Tour in San Diego. Soon after, they were dancing for the likes of Missy Elliott and Meghan Trainor. The dancers, models, and designers won the World of Dance TV show in 2017. The winner of World of Dance! And in time, their relationship with Beyonce has blossomed and even consider the Carters family. Laurent, you posted a photo of the two of you with Beyonce and Blue Ivy, and you said, the, the only people I trust in life. Yes. Why? There's nobody I can trust more than Jay-Z, Beyonce, and Blue Ivy in my life, like the whole family. Famously protecting B on stage, like this wardrobe malfunction in Detroit. When I'm with Beyonce on stage, I make sure that everything is good, because I want her to to do her best. We are to help. They were also there alongside Blue Ivy as she joined her mom center stage. I think she, a 12 years old make me laugh because she's so honest. We have so much fun. Now the twins are harnessing the power of dance into helping students across the country. Partnering with several organizations, they're embarking on the Rise for Mental Health Tour. 42% of students report feeling so depressed, it's difficult to function. It's a statistic lay twins are hoping to change by drawing from their own experiences. He did go through things I would never go through. I did go through things that he probably still don't know. Not like it's easy to talk about, it's just that sometimes you will tell me something and I'm like, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you didn't tell me this. I can't believe you did go through this and I didn't know where I was. On the tour, sessions begin with a classroom portion, then a dance workshop led by the twins. How do you help these kids with mental health through movement? When we speak to those kids, we let them share issues that they have personally that they never said to anybody, to our ear, and we don't share this to the room. And we let them express their feelings through, through bodies, wherever, wherever the whatever body goes. Whatever they're feeling. Music, conversation, and dance can universally heal. Yeah. Feeling inspired, we finished our time with dance. Yeah, with these shoes. Oh, let's go. But with a little twist. So it's a this or that dance off, okay? Who is the troublemaker? I think I know who it is. How many guys? You happy? Okay, who is the biggest risk taker? Who is the most creative? No, Larry, you, can, you cannot say. Okay, I cannot say, but who got more ideas? Who created the human chair? Oh, oh no, that was both of us. That's both, That's of, both us. of you? Every queen has her throne, and for Beyonce, it's the twins' human chair. This seat may be reserved, but hey, I tried. <laughs> All right, let's keep on grooving. We tapped a special young man who's gone viral for spreading joy in an unlikely place, the subway. I joined him for an unforgettable ride beneath the streets of New York City. Check it out. It's a little bit nerve-wracking 
setting up, my board in hand, my bag in the other hand, walking into a platform full of people looking the opposite direction. But then as soon as I set the board down, get my shoes on, the nerves are automatically going. I'm connecting with the audience. And tap dancer Jaboan Dixon has chosen one of the toughest audiences in the world, the millions of riders of the New York City subway system. In New York, everybody has a mission and somewhere they're going, something to do, someplace to be. So I have to be a dynamic enough part of the city that it makes them want to stop and be like, oh, let me, let me stop and experience this New York experience right now in the moment. But Jaboan's story didn't start in the city of New York. It started in the city of Chicago, where he grew up tap dancing with his family. And then his longtime girlfriend, Nicole, got a part in the Broadway show Six, and he followed her to New York to support her dream while auditioning for his big break as well. My options were a job that you can do like right away, you know, do like a waiter type of thing or like a bartender. Or I was like, I can take my art and bring it straight to the people and see what happens from that. And what has happened is something extraordinary. Connections with commuters, shy smiles from children who then jump in to learn, and sometimes, like today, a full-on dance Five, party six, with seven, a middle eight. school from Houston, Texas. Seven, eight. Five, six, seven, eight. Okay, you know what? I just witnessed some magic. Yeah. I just witnessed some subway yeah. magic. I'm down here bringing the tap to the people. What was going on with you and the crowd? That was the exchange that happens a lot down here. How do you capture someone's attention in all the chaos down here? You just kind of have to be able to connect with them fast enough for them to want to connect with you, you know? This is like a communication without any words. Yeah, You're yeah. Just doing it. That's what tap is, to be honest. It's a conversation, you know? So if I can give you a little rhythm with my feet and that captures you enough, that's, uh, that's the goal right there. And I had a goal myself. I wanted Jaboan to teach me how to make my own magic in the subways. Okay. So I want you to give me two steps, but then we're gonna clap. So it's just like a right, left, stepping both feet and then a clap. Yeah, you know, kind of like a We Will Rock You type of thing, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Soon I was shuffle ball changing as well as, okay, maybe these sweet tourists from Iowa. The big finish comes what when we put it together. In five, six, seven, eight, step, step, clap, step, step, clap. Shuffle, step, uh, shuffle, step, uh, toe, toe, heel, heel, step, step, step. Yes. And then the bow, though, and then the bow. You gotta finish with a bow, you know? <laughs> By the way, you are so magnificent. Thank you, thank you. You are, you are full of, like, joy and positivity and all the things that are needed everywhere. Even in all the noise underneath the streets of New York City, Jaboan brings the light. You, and I feel like you have a million of these connections on the subway. Tell me about a couple that hit you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the connections are great on the subway. Uh, oftentimes, people will stop and watch, and just the smiles on their faces are one. Are, is one in motivation in itself. But sometimes people will actually contact me after the fact, hit me up in my DMs on Instagram or something yeah. like that, and be like. Man, I watched you today, and, and my and my child is still tap dancing yeah. months Aww. ago. Or one time, I actually had a girl contact me that had been suicidal and had been going to therapy uh, about these suicidal thoughts, yeah. and so she was keeping a journal mm. of little things, little reasons to live. Aww. And she put me in the journal <laughs> for that day, and I, just to be able to make it to somebody's day, they're like, you're you're part of their reason for yeah. living for that day. You know, the connections and the experiences I have down there are great, you know? It's yeah. incredible yeah. what you do. And I know you do it for, like, pure love. Yeah, It's absolutely. your passion. Absolutely. You dance whether someone's paying, whether there's an audience, you yeah. dance because it's in you. Yeah, yeah, no matter what. I'm, I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm dancing right now. Even <laughs> talking, but like, I think yeah. that is really the life lesson, because sometimes you have a passion, you think, well, I can't get paid for it, so therefore I'm not going to do it. I'm going to have to do this grinding 9-to-5 job. But yeah. you figured out a way to do both. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and coming from Chicago, 
Chicago. Uh, shout out to Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. He's a celeb, by the way, in <laughs> Chicago. Everybody knows him there. Uh, but yeah, it, it trains you to go out, to know how to go out and create your opportunity. Yeah. Here in New York, there's opportunity everywhere, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. Chicago is an amazing city as well, but you kind of have to create your own opportunity or wait for it to come for you, you know? Can we see some moves? Let's make this up. Oh, yeah. All right. Happen. Oh, yeah. Let's what, do it. What, what, what we want to do? I don't know. Chipotle. What we want to do? How about a little step, shuffle, hop, step, step, yeah, shuffle, hop, step. Okay. Yeah. A little something like that. that. Okay. Thank you. Ready? All right. Start what are we going to go through what we did last? Okay. So okay. we're going to do a little bit I of won't from, remember. from last time. So a little of this. Okay. latest viral video to boost your day. Stay with us. video and it'll brighten your day. Check it out. Andre Simmons is a football dad through and through. He loves to watch his sons play, but you know what else he's passionate about? What? He's a cheer dad. Uh, Let's see Andre right there in step with his daughter, the entire cheer team. Dad miss a beat. His wife posted this video on social media saying he wanted his whole life to be a cheer dad. The only question is, I mean, who's enjoying it more? It looks like, is it the girls? Is it him? The cheerleaders? But dad's having a ball. That is all for today. We hope we're able to start your day off with a smile. Maybe we inspired you to do something nice for somebody. Let's all do that today and every day. And we'll see you next time with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day. This is Shop All Day Fall Hall. I'm Chassie Post. In Chassie's closet, I'll share my favorite fashion pieces you'll want to add to your wardrobe. I'm Makon Jovo, and in Influencer Trends, I'm bringing you the experts who know it all. I'm Alexa Arendt. In Get Ready With Me, I'm showing you my fall makeup routine filled with tried and true beauty products that I'm obsessed with. Let's get shopping. Hi there, I'm Chassie Post and I picked out my perfect fall uniform filled with effortless and versatile pieces that you can mix and match all season long. Now, if you want to shop any of my favorite items, just scan the QR code at the corner of the screen to check out everything in Chassie's closet. So let me tell you what I'm loving this fall, starting with some major league style. This is one of fall's most fabulous toppers, the baseball cap, right? And these are such massive trends. I mean, we've seen them everywhere, on celebrities, on influencers. And what I like about this season's baseball caps is, instead of just the plain cotton, these have been done up in some of the most luxurious fall fabrics. I mean, look, we've got rich suede, I mean, a herringbone tweed baseball cap, a wide whale corduroy, even leather. And if you want to go for a splurge, check this out. We've even got a cashmere baseball cap. This is from the brand Quince. And just love the sporty vibe of the baseball cap. It looks great on everyone, and it's so fun to give your you know, fall look a little zhuzh. 
Next up, one of the biggest trends we actually saw on the fall runways was wearability. Elevated staples that, you know, have staying power that you can wear again and again. And this is one of my favorite elevated staples. Yes, the oversized striped sweater from Gap. And guess what, guys? It's TikTok famous. This sweater has over 85 million views on TikTok. And here's why I think it's so popular. It's the perfect combo of classic. I mean, the stripes, right? Nautical chic, French girl chic. I mean, I love any stripe. And combined with the modern silhouette. Yeah, it's oversized. And a lot of people think, an oversized sweater? Ugh, is it gonna be bulky? No, that's part of the genius of this sweater because see that right there? The side vent, that little slit there? allows the sweater to lay and drape really nicely. So you can even layer over this sweater. So I love it. It's made out of a soft cotton. You can't beat it. So now let's make an outfit, right? So the striped sweater, oh my gosh, how cute does this look with the faux leather pant? I love it. And I gotta tell ya, faux leather pants are my most valuable player when it comes to my fall uniform. And if you like the jogger silhouette, <laughs> and who doesn't, right? Let's face it. Then you're gonna love this pair from The Drop. And look, it's got an elastic waistband. I mean, check out these fabulous colors. I mean, it even has, you know, an easy, straight, slightly tapered leg. And this faux leather is really supple and soft. It comes in five different colors. And you can wear it with your striped sweater, but you can also dress these up maybe with a bodysuit and some heels for a night on the town. And I mean, check that out. Look, with our next super versatile piece, this is perfect for work anytime, right? So that brings me to our next elevated staple. I don't think it gets more versatile than a white button down shirt. It goes with everything in your closet. You can style it a million different ways and it's never going out of style. But the big news with the white button down shirt this season is the silhouette. We're seeing oversized versions. It's big, but it's not too big. It just gives you that kind of cool effortless vibe. And look, you can wear it tucked in, you can do the half tuck, you can tie it at the waist, you can wear it untucked. It hits at a really flattering part on the leg. So it's also great to wear with leggings. So this is a piece that you're gonna wear with everything else that you own. And I think it looks really, really cute with our next mega huge denim trend. Yes, the denim midi skirt. It combines two of my favorite things, the cool factor of denim with a midi skirt. I mean, such an easy silhouette to wear, right? And it's really an elevated sort of alternative to wearing jeans, right? Before we go to accessories, let me tell you what else makes a great accessory. A little graphic punch around the shoulders. I mean, so chic. So now let's talk about some other accessories that I'm really loving for fall, starting with the stack necklace trend. We fell in love with this brand. It's called Mint and Lily, and they have some gorgeous and really affordable options to help you start your stack. And first, look at this beautiful, initial medallion. It's called the Pave Initial Medallion. You can get your initial in little CZ stones. It comes on a little clasp that works as a charm holder. And this would technically be in that subtrend of the charm necklace, which I love and I wear every single day. And I just think this is so beautiful and it's $39. You can't beat the price. Or you can layer up with a zodiac pendant, so you can choose your sign for just around $29. And then if you love, you know, a chunkier chain, this is called the flat curb chain, which I think is stunning on its own or added to your stack. And of course, I call it the modern classic, the paperclip chain, which everyone loves. They've got so many options here. So I think you're gonna have a great time exploring. So on to some shoes that you're gonna get so much wear out of this fall. This is the slip on loafer flat. And we all know that loafers have been just having a huge moment for the past couple seasons. I love that this little flat is a hybrid of the loafer, the smoking slipper, and a flat. 
It's the pared down lines that I think are so cool with this and the details like this little notched upper, the pointed toe, look out for pointed toes, they're back this season. And what I really like about these, they're so cushy. I mean, look at that insole. The brand says they have double memory foam in here. So you're gonna be wearing these and your feet are gonna be happy. Plus, I really like the price on these and all the different colors and patterns. I mean, look, leopard print. I mean, never met a leopard print I didn't like. And leopard truly is the new neutral. Trust me, it goes with everything. So I'm really excited to tell you guys about one of my favorite bags this fall. And this is a little two-in-one bag. Okay, I know you're liking the quilting and this great gold chain, right? It is not only a belt bag, so it's got lots of little loop here and a little clip. How cute is that? So I can wear it at my waist, or if I'm thinking, you know what I'd really like? I'd like a crossbody. Well, this little bag can do that too. I just clip in on one of the other little loops and check it out. And I don't have to tell you guys about the perfect convenience of a crossbody. It's like having your own personal assistant, right? Everything right at the ready. And this bag looks small, but it's really roomy. I can fit my giant phone in there, all my essentials. I love the quilting. I love the gold chain. It gives me high-end designer vibes without the high-end designer price tag. Plus, it comes in so many cool colors. I love the red. Red, look out for red as one of the it colors, especially in accessories this fall. But look, the hunter green, the bone, the black. This is gonna be a bag you're gonna love wearing. And last but not least, look at these fabulous signs. A neon sign, Chessie's Closet, and these fabulous wooden signs. Happy fall, y'all, and hello, pumpkin. Well, guess what? These are custom signs from one of my favorite brands. It's called House of Rounds. They can do your name or your kid's name or you know a favorite phrase, and they can create it in neon or in wood. So these are such a great way to brighten your fall. So happy fall, y'all, and thanks for coming to Chassis Closet. If you'd like to add any of these pieces to your closet, you know what to do. Just scan the QR code to shop it all. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Next up, some fun and easy hacks to hosting and making your home feel like fall. Plus, get ready for all the beauty this season. Don't go away.
Hi there, I'm Shop All Day contributor Makon Jovu, and I'm here with my friend, chef and host of Head of the Table, Elena Besser. Hi, Elena. Hi, Mako. Oh. So great to be with you. I'm so glad you're here. Speaking of things I love, there's so much to love about fall. The leaves are changing. It's sweater weather. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And it's my favorite time of year to host family and friends. And today I'm going to be sharing some simple ways to create quintessential fall vibes right at home. That's right. And if you want to shop any of our favorite items, just scan the QR code at the corner of the screen. Now let's start off with a fall cocktail. Elena, what are we making? We are making one of my go-tos. I've become so obsessed with this cocktail. Mm -hmm. It is a hot toddy, okay. and you are going to be so surprised by how easily it all comes together. So mm. this is a whiskey-based cocktail, and you could make it with bourbon or rye, whatever your preference is, and you're going to be shocked by how how easy it is to make this and I promise you it's gonna become your obsession as well. So Something what you'll more. do is you'll take the lemon and the whiskey and you'll pour that right on in. We have two ounces of our whiskey. Wonderful. And it can be any whiskey of your choice. And also, if you're not a whiskey person, you could do a spiced rum, which would be really delicious. Ooh, that sounds fun. Then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a little honey. So how do you use this? I've seen this, but it's not a spoon. I what know, I it seems really confusing. Okay, show me. But what's great is all of these ridges in here are mm -hmm. going to allow you to really easily Look turn it and just let it fall. And like, isn't that the most stunning that thing you've ever seen? And then you're going to take a lemon that's studded with the clove. And look at how pretty this lemon is. I mean, that clove, again, the way that you did this is stunning. Do I just throw it in there? Yes, you'll just pop it right in, just okay. really delicately if you so need my help. I'm so nervous. Okay, but you can do this at home too. You can totally it's do so it at home. It's so easy. My trick for the cloves is anytime you see the uh, citrus segments, mm -hmm. that's where you're gonna pop a clove in. Beautiful, see, I like love so. that. It's so easy. So What's we next? have that. So you'll take your hot water. Okay. Do you want me to pour it in? Please. Look at how beautiful that is. What and do I do you'll with this? take this and you'll stir it all together really okay. delicately okay. to make sure that that honey is mixed into the drink. And you can take the little cinnamon stick. Uh -huh. And can have you ever seen anything I more gorgeous? I have not. I, this is so beautiful. Right? Perfect for the cold weather. Here's the test. Here we go. I hope you like it. Mmm. Mmm. This is delicious. Isn't oh, it just cozy? Mm. Mm. It's like the perfect tint of the cinnamon. It's so warm. It's just like, like you said, warming up my insides right. in the best possible way. Just one more sip, just yeah, to make please, sure. Please, please, good. Just to make sure it's okay. Mmm. Right. This is delicious. So I'm gonna put this down for a second. Great. I'll come back to it. But now let's set the table. I want my dinner table to feel elevated, whether it's Thursday, it's a Saturday, or yes. it's around the holidays. And the first thing you want to start with is the ambiance. And for me, lighting is everything. So let's set the vibes. How great is that? Aren't so these, these cool? Are just touch lamps. You yes. just touch them and then you can kind of accentuate yeah, the Yeah, there light. are three different temperatures of light. So we have a cool light, we have a warm light, mm -hmm. and then we have an in-between. Mm. So I personally like the warm light. I'm attracted to oh, like more beautiful. of the like golden hues. And these lamps are the coolest. I actually own them at home. Oh, so are they in your <laughs> kitchen or your bedroom? They're all over <laughs> because you know why? They're cordless oh, nice. and they're rechargeable. And the gold is the way the Art Deco style, which yeah. is very much in trend right now. Exactly. Love so that. the best part about it is you can take them everywhere. You can have them on your kitchen mm. island. You can have them at the dining room table. Bring them over to the coffee table. Keep the vibes and the mood right. <laughs> Keep it right. Speaking of the vibes and the mood, customizing your dinner table is such a great way to get your guests really really engaged. It's true. And look at our names on these little cards. Aren't they cute? It's just so adorable. So these are just regular cones and you just slot the names in yeah, here? Yeah, just a good old fashioned pine cone from Michael's. And then you can get a little name card. You and it looks so elevated. It doesn't look outdoorsy and woodsy. Another way we did that is with this right here, this yes. fall foliage. These are beautiful maple leaves from Crate and Barrel. Beautiful. So they have tons of different types of leaves, tons of different types of branches. These you could put in a vase, you could lay them on the table, and like what you said, take them, trim a little piece mm -hmm. off, and use it in your napkin. So speaking of this napkin. Yes, it's like a linen napkin, which by the way, matches, matches my you. dress. So that's <laughs> the fun thing about like dressing up again, setting the ambiance. You could do that with your clothes and accessories, the napkins. Exactly, so these are fantastic linen napkins. They come in tons 
are different colors and they're from H&M. I am obsessed with their home wear. These placemats, I find that they protect my counter yes. and my dinner table too, so I love these. And they instantly elevate any dining experience. So these are round jute placemats. Elena, I'm so excited. I'm about to try something I've never done before. Yay. And when I think of fall, this is a fall essential, so I can't believe I've never done it. We're yes. about to carve pumpkins. We are carving pumpkins, Mako. And right. this is all about creating another really fun tablescape. So we have a little craft project here. We've got these little fake pumpkins. We also have this pumpkin carving kit, oh, which yeah. has literally every tool you could possibly need. So what you're going to do is you're gonna start by taking off the little caps. Mm -hmm. So we'll pop those off. I love this because during the holidays, we have a lot of little kids come over the house. Yeah. And sometimes everyone's on their devices, on their phones. So I like that this is like an ageless activity that grandma and young totally. kids and everyone can get involved in. Exactly. Yeah. So all you're going to do is take off the top and okay. you'll take a little tea candle and a pencil. Yes. And you'll just trace the circle of the tea candle really easily like this. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to take that and we're gonna take our little carving device. You can really pick any tool that you want here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going with one that feels like it would work well. <laughs> Are these super sharp? Um, I'd say be careful. Like if you're doing this with your kids, yeah. like definitely start as mom and dad like doing this section mm -hmm. and then have them help with the scooping. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna just cut along the edge, mm -hmm. just like this. Perfect. And the inside has some styrofoam. If mm -hmm. you scoop out the insides, yes. and then you have these beautiful final products. And then you just take the little. You take the candle. And by the way, these are battery operated? Yes, battery operated. Okay. You pop that right on in. But this is just such a fun way beautiful. to create like a decorative display at home in the middle of your table. It looks so beautiful. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. If you want to shop any of Elena's essentials, simply scan the QR code to make your home feel like fall. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through the QR codes or links on our website. Don't go away. We've got another haul and it's all about the beauty you need for the fall.
Hi, I'm Alexa. I love all things beauty, so I'm taking you step by step into my daily routine as I get ready for pumpkin picking. I'll share my glam secrets and what products I love to use during the crisp fall months. And if you wanna get the same look, just scan the QR code below to shop everything. Come get ready with me. I've already gone in and moisturized and primed my face and I'm so excited to show you my foundation, but I cannot start until I use my favorite viral makeup headband and I can tell you a million reasons why, but I will just tell you two. It keeps all of the flyaways out of your hair during your makeup routine and it does not crease your hair, so it does not mess it up if you've already done it. Let's go in. I'm gonna start with my e.l.f foundation. I am obsessed with this for many reasons. It comes in 20 shades, so it really matches any skin color or type, blends beautifully into your skin, and is streak-free thanks to this incredible foundation brush right here. It is so compact. It blends so smooth into your skin and it has medium coverage for any kind of makeup person. Whether you're a beginner or an advanced, it gives you that perfect finish for that flawless makeup look. So next, we're gonna go in with some concealer. This is my favorite. It is by Tarte and what I love so much about it is that it has a crease-free formula I put it right on my forehead and I also add it to my nose and my chin to give that brightness factor so that you don't have a full face of one color. Next up is the holy grail of any makeup routine. I took a long time to figure this out and how to use it, but it is a setting powder. And what it does is it takes away all of that shine. If you're an oily skin person, which I definitely am, I love to really just put the powder in all of those places so that throughout the entire day, you don't have to worry about getting oily. So you could be out in the sun, you can be out on a pumpkin farm, you can be out in any location and you'd never have to worry about your skin moving, about your makeup moving or anything in between. And you can see right in front of you, the shine start to completely disappear. I'm putting it right underneath my eyes, on my chin, on my nose, and on my forehead. And we are set and we are ready to contour. So I start off with my favorite bronzer. This is the best and I'll tell you why. It has the most flawless color ever. And what I love about it the most is that you can put as much or as little as you want. If you're looking for a more natural look, I say to go in super light, only put one, maybe two layers on. I'm someone who really, really likes to contour my face. I like to add warmth, and I really like to just keep those lines super smooth so that I look super snatched. I also add it right up here to my temples to give that definition in your face. I even will go into my jawline a little bit. Moving on to a timeless product that we all know we all love, blush. I remember growing up and watching my grandma put blush on and my mom put blush on and all the actors on stage. And it's my absolute favorite thing because it adds color to your face. So we've added the warmth, we've added the definition, and now why not add a little bit of color to those gorgeous cheeks that you just outlined. This one is by Laura Geller and I'm obsessed with it because it has a little tint of sparkle. I'm putting it right on those cheekbones, making them pop, and just amplifying the contour a little bit more. And finally, we're gonna add a tiny bit of highlight. This is the end of your contour journey, and we're going to add a tiny, tiny bit to those brightening places. So, I just put a little bit on my nose right here. It makes it look a little bit smaller and a little bit more snatched, which I love. I add a tiny, tiny bit to the top of my cheeks. I'll put a little bit on my forehead and a tiny bit on my chin. So all that does is add a little bit of sparkle. It's time to go in to the brows. Now, the brows have made their triumph comeback and the thick brow is in. But whether or not you're looking for a thin or thick brow, this is your pencil. 
that has a dual side, which is two tools in one. It has a brush, so what I like to do is I like to set my brows with the nice shape because we just went in with all that face makeup. We wanna make sure that our brows are nice and clean and they're shaped exactly how we want them. Then we go in with the other side and this tip is so precise, it can give you any kind of brow you're looking for. So I like to go in and I like to give a nice little thick brow. I go right in like this and since it's so fine, what it also does is it kind of creates that hair look so that it looks super natural. So after you apply and fill in your brows, what's so great is that you could take that brush again and you brush it all into the hair. So it makes that natural look just a little bit more amplified and it really gives you just that gorgeous brow that you are looking for. Amazing. And finally, the end, the lips. And the lips are everything. And what I love so much about a lip color is that you could do whatever you want for any kind of day. So it's fall, we want a nice nude, nice you know, brown, that's the lip we're going for. So I'm gonna go in and I'm going to start by lining my lips with my absolute favorite lip liner. It comes in 12 different colors. But after that, you will see that I'm gonna go in with NYX and this is the best butter gloss ever. And I love it so much because it actually feels like butter. It does not get sticky. It lasts all day. It doesn't clump up. And especially if we're out pumpkin picking, there's nothing worse than the wind blowing in your hair and everything getting all crazy and it getting caught in your lip gloss. This will not do that, let me tell you that much. So let me show you how we do it. And right there you can see, all it does is you take a tiny, tiny, tiny little layer and it blends right into your lip color to make a flawless, gorgeous lip look. The liner keeps everything from smearing or getting all over the place and it just keeps everything intact for your entire day. So our makeup look is done and I am so excited to show you my outfit. So here's my outfit of the day, and I cannot leave the house without my absolute favorite hat from H&M, and of course, my bag to carry all of my beauty needs. And remember, if you wanna shop any of my favorites, scan the QR code to get my look. Thanks for getting ready with me. I hope we inspired you today. Stay tuned for another episode of Shop All Day next week. Bye. Yo, today, all day. Pucker up, because up next on Hashtag Cooking, it's all about lemons. Samadada making her favorite recipes with the versatile citrus fruit. Instead of turning lemons into lemonade, try making Sama's pasta salad with a rich, and creamy lemon tahini sauce. Then for dessert, whipping up a lovely lemon loaf cake. Check it out. I love the smell of lemons too. It's so fresh. I feel like I'm at a spa, but I'm making a cake instead, which is better for sure. So everyone has been telling you to make lemonade out of the lemons that life has apparently given you. But you know what? You don't have to listen to those people. I'm sure they have good intentions, but they don't really know how to hashtag live laugh lemons. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to show you how to make two of my favorite recipes that use lemons. My lemon tahini pasta salad, which is zesty and bright, paired with some zucchini and tomatoes. And my gorgeous lemon loaf cake, which is fluffy and just lightly sweet, the perfect companion to your coffee or tea. Some things I think about. Are we calling a pasta salad a salad just so we can feel better about the fact that we're really just eating chilled pasta? Whatever the case, I'm on board, especially with this lemon tahini pasta salad. It pairs two of my favorite things together, tahini and lemon, for a fresh and light pasta that I guess we can call a salad. I'm using shallots, garlic, some tomatoes for sweetness, and a zucchini in here to make it a lot more flavorful and complex. I'm gonna start by just preparing all of my ingredients because I love being prepared and I love having my cooking process go a bit quicker. So we're gonna start with the shallot. I'm just gonna dice my shallot. If you don't have a shallot on hand, don't stress, don't worry, you can use a red onion. I'm just gonna slice this little end off right here. I'm gonna make little parallel cuts into the shallot. 
Watch your fingers. You need those. And then I'm gonna make perpendicular cuts right on top of the shallot, keeping this end intact so we can hold on to it. And then I'm just gonna dice. I'm gonna add my shallots back into their bowl, into their little home until I'm ready to use them. Probably doing this the dangerous way, but I'm living on the edge. All right, so I'm gonna mince some garlic. A really easy way to do this, I'm gonna put your garlic on your cutting board, use the flat edge of your knife, smash it, and then we're just gonna mince. Yes, I am using a lot of garlic, and you're probably wondering, wow, Salma, that's a lot of garlic. Why are you using so much garlic? I love garlic. The residual uh, outcome is sometimes like you end up smelling like garlic a little bit for the rest of the day, but it's a price we can pay for a flavorful pasta, you know? And now we're going back into my bowl, back into my home, my garlic home. <laughs> garlic like ends up being a bit of my perfume after <laughs> I cook with it for a bit. I promise I still have friends, still love me. <laughs> even though I have some residual garlic scent. Now I'm just gonna slice my tomatoes in half. I'm using grape tomatoes here, but you can go ahead and use cherry if that's what you have on hand. The tomatoes are gonna add a nice pop of sweetness to this pasta, which uses tahini. It's a very earthy flavor, so we like having that balance. You can totally slice these tomatoes lengthwise, but I'm just gonna do them sort of like a globe because I think it looks prettier. It looks nice. Looks pretty. Okay, adding these back into my tomato home. All right, now I'm gonna cut my zucchini, trimming the ends off. You could also slice it lengthwise and then half it, but I like to do the full rounds here. I'm cutting the zucchini pretty thin because I want it to cook through pretty quickly and get nice and tender. I wanted to add zucchini to this recipe because zucchini is such a neutral tasting veggie. Like it really absorbs a lot of the flavor of anything that it's kind of cooked with. So that's why this was the lucky pick for my vegetable addition in this pasta. My zucchini, tomatoes, shallot, garlic, everyone is ready. Now I'm just gonna heat some olive oil on my pan and start cooking the shallot. Once the oil shimmers, I'm gonna add my shallot. So my olive oil is ready, and now I'm just gonna add my shallot. I wanna cook the shallots for about five minutes until they get nice and tender and translucent and start to brown around the edges. You want it to smell really fragrant and aromatic. It seems so good. You'll notice that it's already starting to get some nice color. That's what we want. I wouldn't mind like smelling like a shallot, but somehow it's always garlic. <laughs> like, how did I get this fate? So I think what we figured out here is that I'm starting a perfume line. <laughs> oh, to shallot, oh, to garlic. All right, this is exactly what I'm looking for. It's starting to brown, it looks tender, it smells amazing. Now it's time for the garlic. We're going in. The reason we didn't add the garlic in with the shallots together is because garlic doesn't take that long to cook, so we didn't want the garlic to burn. That would be a problem. We want the garlic to cook in with the shallots for about one to two minutes, not too long and then we'll be good to go. And don't forget to season with some salt and pepper. A little salt. Some pepper. I'm gonna go ahead and add my zucchini. I wanna stir the zucchini in with the shallot and garlic so everybody becomes friendly, everything is nice and incorporated. 
In case anything starts to burn, you can feel free to add a splash or two of water. I'm gonna add just a little splash of water. You'll notice when the zucchini gets a little bit more tender, it looks a little bit more flexible, a little more bendy. That's good, that's where we want it. These are looking nice and tender and translucent, and now it's time for the tomatoes. I don't wanna cook the zucchini too much longer because they're gonna cook with the tomatoes as well, so we don't want anything to burn. I'm gonna add my tomatoes. Look how pretty! We want to cook the tomatoes to soften them, to release their juices, but we don't want to overcook them. I want them to maintain their shape, and if you cook them for too long, they'll break down. They're looking pretty good. <laughs> the zucchini is really finding its moment. All right. My zucchini is tender, my tomatoes are juicy, these are done. I'm gonna set them aside to cool and then I'm gonna work on my pasta. Now we're gonna cook our pasta. One very important step, don't forget to salt your pasta water or I will come find you. Okay, make sure you cook your pasta according to the instructions on your package and add my pasta in. While the pasta is cooking, I'm gonna make my sauce. This is a lemon tahini pasta salad. So the base of the sauce is going to be, you guessed it, lemons and tahini. I've got my tahini in this bowl. It's a very earthy flavor, so it's gonna pair super nicely with that bright and tangy acidic lemon. I'm gonna add my lemon juice. A good tip to get all of the juice out of your lemon and to loosen it up a bit is just to roll it before you juice. I'm gonna slice my lemon. Fresh. Now, I'm gonna juice it straight into my tahini. I am nothing without seasoning, and neither is this pasta, so we're gonna add some of my favorites. Got some cumin here. Red pepper flakes for a little bit of spice. Some salt. Then a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. I'm gonna whisk this up. You'll notice that the mixture will start to seize, meaning it's gonna be a bit tougher to mix it, which is why we have a little H2O to save the day. You wanna make sure your water is cold and we'll just add a little bit at a time until it reaches your desired consistency.
See how when you add that cold water, it becomes so much smoother and also helps you get everything well incorporated. You want it to be velvety and rich, and smooth. Just gonna season it to taste because that's always important. We wanna get it exactly where we want it. Taste a little. Mm. So good. Add a little more salt and a little more pepper. My sauce is done. And you know what's crazy? I finished making it before the pasta was even done cooking. I mean, let's talk about saving time in the kitchen. I'm gonna check my pasta. We're gonna be a bit of a helicopter pasta parent. Go fish for one. I can't even see, I'm too short. <laughs> And you want it to be al dente, meaning you still want a bit of a bite in it. You can bite it or just break into it with your finger to see. Still needs a little bit more time. I'm gonna leave it in there for a little bit longer until it's a bit more cooked through. My pasta is done. Now before I drain it, I'm gonna save a little bit of that pasta water for later. This is gonna help bind and thicken my sauce in case I need it. I've sort of been waiting for this moment my whole life. It is time to assemble the pasta. Got my zucchini and tomatoes here. I'm just gonna add my pasta straight into my pan. Look at that. And just mix this around just to incorporate the pasta in with the veggies. I wanna make sure that garlicky goodness and the shallots really coat that pasta well. <laughs> a rogue pasta, no problem. And now it's time to add my sauce. I mean, look how creamy that is. It's like velvety smooth. See you later. Okay. I'm just gonna coat the sauce in with the pasta really well. We don't want any piece of pasta to feel lonely. It needs to have some sauce on it. This looks good, this looks well incorporated. This looks like everyone is has become besties. It's time to plate. So I know this is supposed to be a pasta salad, but a little fun fact, you can eat this room temp as well. So I'm gonna serve myself a bowl. I can't not eat it right now. And I'm gonna let the rest chill in the fridge. Get that zucchini, those tomatoes. It looks so creamy, but there's no dairy in it. Isn't that crazy? This looks good for me. <laughs> I'm gonna squeeze a little lemon on top, just for a little hint of tartness, a little extra. I mean, she looks cute for sure. It's time to take a picture. What's nice is that you've got so many colors going on. You've got the bright pop of red from the tomatoes. You've got the green from the zucchini. The pasta is like a nice canvas for all of it to sit on top of. Looks delish. <laughs> Getting really up close and personal here. I don't think the pasta will mind. <laughs> okay, I got the shot. Which means I need to eat. Okay, I'm going in. Gotta get a little bit of everything. Little tomato, little pasta. I'm gonna try and do this in a dainty manner. It's probably not gonna work. Okay. Mmm. I mean, usually think of pasta as something that's pretty heavy, but you've got this brightness from the lemon that allows it to feel super light and refreshing tomatoes for sweetness, the zucchini for a little veg moment up in there. Mmm. This is gonna go in the fridge. I'm gonna transfer it to a bowl, let it chill. It keeps really well in the fridge. It's also really nice to know you've got a little meal waiting for you in the fridge whenever you're hungry or just simply want a delicious pasta salad. 
transferred everything to my bowl. I'm just gonna cover it. Now I'm gonna take it to the fridge to chill. And then when I come back, we're gonna make my lemon loaf cake. This lemon loaf cake is inspired by my parents' citrus trees in California. My dad tends to our lemon trees because he's the only one in my family with a green thumb, or at least he tries to have one. So I wanted to make a really delicious post-breakfast sweet treat for us to enjoy together. I've preheated my oven to 350 degrees, and I've also lined my little loaf pan with some parchment paper. I did this with cute little flaps so that you'll easily be able to lift the lemon loaf cake up after it's done baking. Now I'm gonna get started on my dry ingredients. I'm using some oat flour and some coconut flour. I really like this because oat flour is nice and hearty and coconut flour is light and absorbent, so they make a really nice pair. I'm just gonna add my coconut flour to my oat flour. I'm gonna add baking powder. I'm gonna whisk everything together. Oat flour and coconut flour are both gluten-free, so if you're into that, that's great. If you're not, I promise you'll still love this recipe. But make sure you do check your oat flour package to ensure you're using the gluten-free variety. We want to whisk this until everything is nicely incorporated. Everything looks nice and incorporated, and now I'm going to start my wet ingredients. I'm going to crack two eggs into my bowl. I'm gonna beat my eggs till they're nice and smooth. All right, this looks nice and smooth. And now I'm gonna work on my lemons. Our star, the lemon. First, I'm gonna zest the lemon into my eggs. What's really great with zest is that it adds this nice fragrance and aroma and adds a lot more of that lemon flavor, which we love for this recipe. The lemon zest smells so fragrant and delicious. It's really gonna amp up that lemon flavor in this lemon loaf cake. I only need about a teaspoon of lemon zest for this recipe, so that should be good. Now time for our juice. Gonna roll the lemon a bit to get more of that juice out. 
really prepped for this lemon loaf cake. I love the smell of lemons too, it's so fresh. I feel like I'm at a spa, but I'm making a cake instead, which is better for sure. Okay, my lemons are all juiced, and now I'm gonna add it straight into my egg and zest situation. Mix this up until it's nice and incorporated. Now I'm gonna add my melted and cooled coconut oil. Mix that up. To sweeten this recipe up, I'm gonna add some maple syrup. I like using maple syrup here because lemon is so tart and acidic and maple is warming and really just delicious and golden, so I find that it's a perfect match made in citrus heaven. A little vanilla extract. <laughs> little splash zone for the vanilla extract. No big deal. And finally, we're gonna add some coconut sugar. The coconut sugar sweetens this up even more, which we love for this lemon loaf cake recipe. I'm gonna just add my dry ingredients straight into my wet. Now I'm gonna fold everything together. You just wanna fold everything in together really gently so everything becomes nice and incorporated. You will know when it's done, when the batter is thick and sticky. We're looking pretty cute, to be honest with you. Just gonna transfer this batter into my prepared loaf pan. We're just gonna smooth the batter out in the pan, make sure it's evenly distributed. And because we're a fun kitchen here, we're gonna add a little more coconut sugar on top. Just for a little extra sweetness. You don't have to do this. You should do it. Okay, sad news. We do have to allow this loaf cake to leave us for a little bit. It's gonna take a little journey in the oven for 30 to 35 minutes until the edges are nice and golden brown. for about 20 minutes, and because I love being prepared, as you know, 
Got these cute little flaps, which will allow me to just lift it straight up out of the pan and get to slicing. Which I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna slice right into it. I am one of those people that loves a corner piece. Give me all of the corner pieces, all of the edges. That's my jam. I mean, you can't resist. I know you can't. Don't tell me you can't, because I know you're not telling the truth. It's pretty. Get a couple slices on my plate. No, I need a third for sure. I need a third. Okay. You can totally enjoy this solo, but I'm just gonna top it with a few berries, just for a little extra sweetness. Goes nicely with the lemons too. I mean, I think it's ready for its close up. The berries add that nice pop of color as well. Got a blackberry out of place. So pretty. I cannot wait to eat this. All I really need is a cup of coffee with this. That would really pair well. JP! <laughs> Make my day, why don't you? Mm. I'm ready. Now I'm ready to eat this. Okay, I'm gonna get a little piece of the cake, a little berry. Mm. That is good. Mm. It's lightly sweet. It goes perfectly with the berries. The lemon adds that nice zing, that tartness. Maple is like that golden, warming, delicious taste. Don't let your coffee live without this. Whew. Hey guys, super busy, cooking up a storm, but I have something exciting to tell you. Hashtag cooking is back. So tune into today all day. Okay, I got some in the oven, I gotta go. See you later.